Good afternoon, everyone. And I'll uh, call the Stratford City Council meeting to order. Uh, joining me here in the council chamber is Clerk Tatiana Defoe, Deputy Clerk Chris Bantock, and Chief Administrative Officer Joan Thompson, as well as joining us online are a number of our corporate directors and city staff. Uh, welcome the members of council and the public joining us today. And we'll begin this afternoon's meeting with a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. Are there any declarations peculiar interest in the general nature thereof? Seeing none, I'll turn the meeting over to the clerk. Through your worship, item three is adoption of the minutes and there is a motion that the minutes of the regular meeting of council of the corporation of the city of Stratford dated February 8, 2021 be adopted as printed. Moved by. Councillor Henderson and seconded by Councillor Burback. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, if any? That's carried, thank you. Item four is adoption of the addenda. And there was an addenda that was circulated prior to today's meeting to add a delegations under item 7.1 and 7.2. And there is a motion that the addenda to the regular agenda of council and standing committees dated February 22nd be added to the agenda as printed. By Councillor Burback, second by Councillor Ingram, that the addenda be adopted. Any questions? If not, all those in favor? Opposed, Finney? That's carried. Item five is a report of the Committee of the Whole in camera session. And item 5.1 at the February 17th, 2021 session under the Municipal Act as amended, a matter concerning the following item was considered advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. And at the in camera session, direction was given. Item 5.2, just prior to today's regular council session, an in-camera meeting was held to consider items related to um, two that were related to litigation or potential litigation, including match for administrative tribunals and advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege and a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by the municipality. A matter relating to proposed or pending acquisition or disposal of land by the municipality. A fourth item relating to personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal employees or local board employees. And at the in-camera session, there was an added item relating to advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege. At the in-camera session, direction was given on the first four items. Thank you. Next item. Item six is hearings of deputations and presentations. And item 6.1 is the Municipal Modernization Service Delivery Review Final Report. And the first motion on the agenda is that the presentation by Ian Shelley of Blackline Consulting of the Service Delivery Review Report be heard. Thank you, Councillor Clifford will move and Councillor Gaffney will second that Mr. Shelley be heard. All those in favor? Opposed, Fenny, that's carried. And the clerk will let Mr. Shelley in the room. And Ms. Thompson, you'd like to say a few words first? Yes, thank you. Uh, just while we're, uh, we're setting up for the, the presentation, I just wanted to provide an, an introduction and an overview regarding the service delivery review. So in the spring of 2020, the city retained Black Line Consulting to undertake a corporate-wide service delivery review to investigate opportunities for efficiencies and service delivery modernization. City staff have worked with Blackline on an ongoing basis to provide the data and feedback needed to complete this process. The draft report has been provided for council's review and staff recommendations are included for your consideration this afternoon. Um, as for the information included in the staff report, the service delivery review is an important first step, but should be considered a starting point. Many of these recommendations will require further review to determine the steps and resources necessary for implementation. And it is anticipated that the implementation of the recommendations um, will take um, a few years to complete all of them. And I am happy to introduce Ian Shelley from Blackline Consulting to present the overview and answer questions that council may have. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Thompson and Mr. Shelley. We'll turn the meeting over to you. 
Good afternoon, Council. Um, I'm pleased to be here this afternoon, albeit virtually, to take you through a, a short summary of the report and give you an opportunity to, to ask questions on the, on the broader report that you've had an opportunity to review. So I have provided a, a small slide deck as a backdrop, and on page two of that slide deck, um, I've outlined the approach that we took, and I think it's important just to put a little bit of emphasis on the, on the way that we do this. So the first round is data gathering and consultation, and you'll see at the top of that diagram the sources of information that we gathered. We asked staff to actually profile all of their services and what's delivered the resources that go with it, the delivery model. We reviewed an amount of documentation the city was able to provide on, on its operations and the history around some of those operations. We completed a staff survey in which we got over 100 responses asking around 12 questions of staff to provide their input. And we did rounds of interviews with management, with yourselves, council, with, with staff themselves individually. And we did a range of workshops with staff where they could volunteer to a specific session to come in and share their thoughts as well. So we, we tried to conduct an extensive consultation. And from that process, we generate what we refer to as an opportunity index. It's a list of ideas of things that the this, that this city could continue, consider doing differently. Um, and it's an unqualified list in the sense that we've seen something, whether it's uh, an idea that staff have provided us, whether it was something in the documentation or from the survey or from our prior experience, that, that look as though it's something that might be applicable to the city. Um, and the, those opportunities span changes across the board. It could be extending services. It could be being more cost efficient. It could be generating revenue. It could be applying technology. We try not to limit ourselves at, at that point in, in, in the review. And then on page three is this, the, the second half of that approach with this long list of things that could be different. In this case, we generated somewhere over 100 different ideas of changes that could be made in the city. Um, and we go through a process then working this time with CLT to first vet them. Do these opportunities have merit? Is this something the city should e even be considering? And that will weed out a number of the ideas. Um, and then we go through a process of applying a priority and CLT ended up prioritizing, as you'll see on the list here, eight specific opportunities that we took away and formed the, the meat of the report itself is looking at the analysis and the case behind these opportunities. At that midpoint of the review, we think there's something there, but we have no sense of size, scale, feasibility, any of those sort of things. So the second half of the review, the work we've been doing effectively Q4 of last year, is gathering whatever data the city might have that's going to allow us to develop a more detailed understanding of each of those specific opportunities that you see in front of you. On page four, I'm just going to work through quickly the, the summaries of each of those opportunities. So um, the first two, the, the paper and HR, we consider sort of corporate-wide initiatives, the things that would affect many, if not all, of the staff. And right now, as you'll see, the, the city relies on paper for many of its processes. Um, and 72,000 transactions were identified annually across the city that use paper as the primary mechanism for, for communicating, sharing, and running that, those processes. Um, primarily, the first point of contact, you think, is that citizen interaction and, and those application forms that might be coming in. So the first thrust of this recommendation was to move as much to online um, service as you possibly can that relates to any of those communication or application exchanges between residents and, and city staff. Um, second part of it is internally. Um, there's a whole range of processes that operate internally or with other non-resident like people. Um, a good example might be an invoice that comes in from a vendor. Um, and so internally, we've suggested that there are processes and technologies that will allow you to automate those, those transactions as well. So even though you might receive paper, and you may not be able to affect the receipt of paper in certain situations, an effort should be made to, to, limit, to stop the paper flowing into the organization. So converting it to a digital format and allowing the process to run electronically then from, from that point onwards. Uh, the next set of recommendations re relate to HR, um, you know, a, a very small department in the city at the moment with a broad mandate of services and, and limited technology. So even, even though this seems hand in hand with the idea of limiting, eliminating paper or reducing paper, this specifically was about providing technology services that support HR processes. And we broke it into three areas. Um, HR processes directly, such as managing employee records, uh, credential tracking, health and safety. Um, there's a technology called HR Information System 
of our HR management system that's entirely designed to support those processes that HR function needs to do. And along with that, often what comes is what's referred to as self-service, where staff are able to go to their log on their portal, see information about themselves, request things, uh, query, look up information, and it just reduces some of that transactional burden on the HR staff themselves. Another element that we focused on here, and this is you know, common in many municipalities and surprising how much time goes into it, is time and attendance time tracking. So staff filling in timesheets, having them approved, getting them through to payroll. Um, and so we're looking at technology there that could move you away from the manual exercise that the time capture is today and into an electronic one. And the second portion of that time and attendance is thinking differently about staff who have regular periods of time. You know, do we need to get staff who are salaried working 35 hours every week to fill in a timesheet every week? And what's commonly happening is a movement to what's referred to as exceptions-based reporting, where you only report your time when it's different than your standard, as it were. And the final element of that, and I've touched on it already, is the time and attendance material going into payroll and then paying staff and looking at connecting those systems so that there isn't the manual input between you know, time recording, time catcher approval, and then into the payroll and the payment. So a range of, of technology initiatives there to, to reduce some of the transactional and manual work that's happening today. Um, the, the third piece on this slide is looking at the fleet. Uh, the city has a somewhat decentralized fleet at the moment. There is a fleet function that manages the bulk of vehicles, but the school vehicles are under maintained by departments. Um, and right now, there's no um, data that's really captured on the amount of use the vehicles get, sometimes referred to as cab time. You know, how, how much time is that vehicle actually in active use and how much time is it idle doing nothing? Um, so we, we looked, at, looked into ways of estimating this, and it does look as though using kilometers, which is a highly imperfect approach to this, um, it does suggest that it would be worth tracking time to get a better handle on how much usage the fleet is getting. And that would help you determine whether the fleet is optimized, you have the right vehicles or not. Um, it would also help you understand whether greater centralization of that management could be helpful. Um, concepts like pooling of vehicles or sharing of vehicles may be possible. Uh, and having that information on how the fleet is being used today would, would enable you to finally conclude on some of those matters. Moving on to page five. Um, and it's sim similar to fleet, grass maintenance is something that's done by many, many departments across the city. Some it's a significant portion of the time, some, some it's a fairly small portion of the time. So our suggestion here is, is to move towards a more centralized model of, of grass maintenance uh, with one department. And the intent, as we point out at the bottom of the slide, is to look for those scale economies and to reduce the switching costs. If doing an activity is a small amount of someone's time, there's a loss of amount of effort when they move on to the next activity. If you can get people focused on one activity that's a large amount of their time, um, then that would be more efficient. So the idea of having a more specialized grass maintenance function could offer some of those benefits. It may also, in some cases, reduce the equipment you need if there's duplicate equipment around. And the final one may possibly be some, some travel time efficiency around that as well. Um, looking at the airport, um, it's, uh, it's not every municipality that operates an airport. Um, and in the case of Stratford, that airport is subsidized by the city at the moment. And so we looked at what the options available would be to, to reduce the subsidy that the city um, gives to the airport at the moment. And also with the concept that costs do not remain static and potentially in future years, costs would go up. Um, so we looked at a couple of options. One was a fee review, and it does appear comparing the airport to nearby peers that some of the fees could be increased. In some cases, um, you're at that average for the area. In some cases, um, you are somewhat below, and that would increase uh, revenues or has the potential to increase revenues as long as fees aren't increased to the level that would discourage usage in any way. Uh, the second option that we, we looked at as well and, and seemed feasible was to, to look at adding an additional hangar to the, to the facility that could attract uh, additional you know, revenue through fuel sales and from hangar leasing. Uh, and to do that, that would require an expansion of the current taxiway. And within the main report, we'd put a model there to show what the relative expectations of costs and revenues would be from the addition of another hangar. So both options could increase revenue to offset some of the expenses that the city is subsidizing the most. Third on this page, we have fire vehicles. Uh, there's around six or seven, six or seven fire vehicles um, that are currently maintained exclusively by external mechanics. 
And the difficulty with that is the lost time that's associated with taking one of these vehicles to an outside shop uh, and returning, waiting for the repair, going back to collect the vehicle and then returning again. Um, we looked at the, the amount of labor that goes into the actual um, vehicle repairs and it looks as though there's around half a person's labor that, you, that, you're, that you're contracting out to vehicle repairs. So internally, you do have a capability to do fleet maintenance, but the current mechanics are not certified to do specialized emergency vehicles. So we looked into the obviously certifications available for that, and it would be somewhere, somewhere around two to four thousand dollars, depending on which certifications your mechanics would require. Uh, and there's a, on top of the labor saving with something like this, so there would be some reduction in the labor cost for the mechanic work we suspect, and also some some reduction in the part, cost of parts. On to page six, we've got the last two opportunities in, in this part of the report. Um, so similar to grass cutting, invoicing is done in various parts of the, um, the city for, for different reasons. I'll use recreation as an example and rentals. You know, the recreation department is renting its facilities and needs to track that rental. Uh, but the invoicing portion of it, we believe, could, could be centralized with finance. Um, with them, once the, once the actual sale has been made, with them, potentially doing the production and management of those invoices, offering consistency of the process. Um, and we think this applies to other departments ac across the city who, who will be doing a small amount of invoicing. Again, here there's, there's an opportunity potentially for scale economies with, with finance already doing a fairly substantial volume of invoices. Um, adding a smaller volume to them is, is likely to be more efficient than it being done in the departments, although this is only a small volume of work. And the fi final opportunity that we've spent time investigating uh, covers three areas. Um, we called it facility maintenance and utilization. And o over time, the cost to maintain a facility it does change and may change, and it will de change depending on some of those maintenance decisions you made. Um, the city doesn't have very granular data on the maintenance expense that's going in. So we did look at the total maintenance expense of a number of facilities. And it does appear that some of the facilities are materially more expensive. And we use a relatively simple per square foot measure. Um, obviously, the type of facility, what it contains, that will change the actual maintenance. But where we could find somewhat comparable facilities, we did see some that appeared to cost as much as 50% more per square foot to maintain over a period of the year. Um, not enough data to conclude why, and so within this opportunity, we suggested the city starts to do a, a more detailed investigation into what maintenance, co maintenance costs are occurring in these facilities to really determine what is driving the higher expense if it really exists. Um, so better data, along with that, potentially a work order management system will be required to help you track what the work orders are, what the reason for it, um, and what the costs would go into it. Um, the second thing we looked at was um, utilization of facilities, in particular recreation facilities. You, know, you have a range of what we refer to as amenities, you know, things within a recreation facility, whether that's a rink, a track, a gym, a room, a meeting room. You have all of these amenities. Um, and what we wanted to understand was to what degree are they at capacity? You know, it may be booked, but is anyone using it? If it is booked, do you have 10 people that it takes in? Um, if it, what hours is it not booked? Um, and that data just wasn't available. There was some overall usage data of facilities, number of hours utilized per year per facility. Uh, and we could do some indicative tracking to see if there was difference, and there certainly was some variance there. So similar to the, uh, um, the facility maintenance point we, we've suggested here, the gathering good data around capacity and usage and starting to look at what, what's driving usage and what's on what's causing facilities not to be used to help inform you on, on decisions about how you want your facilities to be operated and utilized. Um, final thing is facilities maintenance itself is, is quite decentralized across the city with many departments having some responsibility. There's a few departments that have a large responsibility for a good portion of, of the portfolio, but there's some departments that have a small um, portfolio of responsibilities and it might fall on, on you know the departmental managers to, to take care of finding contractors and that sort of thing. So we looked again, we don't have good data on what the, the facility maintenance spend is, uh, where it's going and who's doing it. So we're suggesting here again that the, with that data, you will be able to conclude on whether it would be beneficial to have a more, more centralized facility maintenance function. And that concludes my summary of opportunities. So I will throw, pass it back to yourself and, and 
ask, ask if there's any questions. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Shelley from members of council? At this time, uh, the recommendation from staff is that they receive the service delivery report and that uh, they refer it to corporate leadership team to begin investigating many of the recommendations and to prioritize them. Uh, and that they also would like to be authorized that staff apply to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs modernization program for intake two uh, to implement the creation of a citizen portal and financial systems enhancement identified in the paperless service delivery review business case. Councillor Ingram, you'll move that. Seconded by Councillor uh, Burback. Thank you. Discussion. Councillor Clifford. Yeah, I was going to ask: Is there a timeline, and is there any way that council could help as it's been, like like if expedited through the process? Because the council we have here, we've only got like a year and a half less uh, left in our time. So I have a concern about uh, we have the, we we have this report in like. A timeline and uh, and and how council can help. Ms. Thompson. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Matheson. Um, so certainly, CLT is uh, committed to looking into the efficiencies that have been identified as opportunities here. I will say, if we were to do all of the projects, it will take time to to do them over a number of years. But we are wanting to focus on ones where we feel that we can uh, move them along quickly, and especially the um, the paperless one because it does have the opportunity to uh, apply for a grant. Um, we are committed as CLT and this corporation to reviewing these efficiencies. We're looking for efficiencies as well. And so we would like to take back the report now to CLT, um, take a look at it, and then we will be reporting out um, to the appropriate committee of council on a regular basis. We are suggesting that perhaps this will be finance and labor relations committee. And once we've had a chance to review the, the report and come up with the implementation plan, um, we could then report on a regular basis to finance committee, whether that is quarterly or more uh, frequently. Um, but that would be my recommendation as for the council involvement with respect to making sure that uh, we are on track for moving ahead on some of these efficiencies. Ms. Thompson, any other questions? If not, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? That's carried. Thank you. Through your worship, item 6.2 is a presentation by Rebecca Garlick, the Climate Change Coordinator of the Stratford's Emission Profile. And the first motion listed on your agenda is that the presentation be heard. Motion by Councillor Vazalakos and Councillor Henderson that Ms. Garlick be heard. All those in favor? Opposed, Fanny? And that's carried. Thank you. If the clerk will let Ms. Garlick into the meeting. Hi, thanks for having me this afternoon. I'm Rebecca Garlick, the Climate Change Coordinator. I'm here today to show you the baseline year emissions for your community greenhouse gas reduction plan. Um, the furthest back I could gather data was for 2017, so that was settled on as the baseline year for our emission reduction target going forward. Um, so next slide, please. So to get started, here's the breakdown of emissions in Stratford. In 2017, Stratford emitted approximately 277,156,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent from the transportation, personal transportation, waste, and building sectors. This amount of emissions is equivalent to approximately just under 60,000 cars driven for about one year. With this total of emissions, the emissions per person in 2017 was equal to approximately 8.93 tons of CO2 equivalent, which is comparable to about two passenger vehicles driven per year per person. Next slide, please. On this slide, it shows the potential future for Stratford in a business as usual scenario. I use the population growth estimate of 4.1% per year and the emissions from 2017. Um, and the increase for a business as usual scenario, if that continues, we could reach levels up to nearly a million tons of CO2 per year, uh, which is equivalent to about 225,497 vehicles driven per year. 
In the next few slides, I'll explain the breakdown of the emissions. So on this page, we see the transportation emissions were, um, were calculated based on the assumption that in 2017, Ontario households had about 1.7 vehicles per household on average. So using this assumption and the average yearly emissions for a passenger vehicle, which is about 4.6 tons of CO2 per year, um, according to the census in 2016, Stratford had approximately 13,675 dwellings. Therefore, I estimated about a 23,247 personal vehicles in the city. So based on these assumptions, the total emissions from personal vehicles are estimated to have been approximately 106,938,000 tons. Recommendations for future inventories going forward could be either purchasing the data of gas sales within Stratford, um, though this may be skewed due to the high number of tourists that come within Stratford, or a more accurate uh, form to calculate this uh, emission source is through vehicle kilometer information. Um, if this could be collected in future inventories, that would offer a more accurate emission count for personal vehicles. Um, emissions from the train were estimated through an approved methodology where total emissions from the railway sector in Canada were divided by the total length of tracks through Canada to give uh, the tons per CO2 per kilometer of track. Uh, based on the length of track in Stratford and the average emissions per kilometer, the trains emitted a negligible amount um, under zero or about 0% of the total emissions. Uh, the total emissions were about 741 tons of CO2 for 2017. Next slide, please. And this sector is the building. So this is separated into residential, commercial, slash institutional. So this includes your businesses, the university and colleges, and also any schools within Stratford. And then finally, manufacturing and industrial. Um, so buildings in total create approximately 40% of, er, of Stratford's emissions. This sector emitted a total of about 130,000 tons of CO2. Uh, these emissions were calculated through electricity, natural gas, propane, and fuel oil consumption. Um, most of the emissions from the buildings within Stratford are associated with natural gas. Homes in Stratford emit approximately 16%. This includes propane, fuel oil, natural gas, and electricity consumption, and emitted a total of 44,341 tons. Commercial and institutional buildings emit approximately 13% of your total emissions, which total to about 36,175 tons. And your industrial and manufacturing emissions make up about 18% of your emissions and emit a total of 49,556 tons of CO2. And these emissions are mainly associated with the natural gas consumption for heating the facilities. Next slide, please. And finally, the final sector is waste, which makes up about 14% of Stratford's total emissions, approximately uh, 39,000 tons. This was calculated through the PCP tool, um, knowing that Stratford has a landfill gas collection system that covers about 50% of the landfill. And using that amount, the system captured, um, I could put that into the PCP tool and that gave me approximate emission total through that. Uh, we anticipate that the Green Bend program will significantly help reduce the emissions from solid waste moving forward. And so moving forward in the development of the plan, uh, so ne next steps will have to be taken. Uh, first is to set our reduction target. Um, both in Ontario and Canada, a reduction target for 2030 has been set for about a 30% below their baseline years. Their baseline years are quite a number of years um, before 2017. Um, and then Canada has also set a reduction target for 2050 to become net zero. And they've come out with a new ambitious uh, climate plan for that. And so after the survey, uh, I completed earlier, or I guess later last year, um, I reviewed and input some data and supporting information for the various climate actions uh, to go into our climate plan. Next slide, please. And so here's a list of some priorities that were continuously suggested by residents in Stratford. Um, of course, focusing a lot on the industrial and manufacturing emissions and holding those accountable for, for reducing emissions. Uh, there was definitely concern around removing barriers and for individual actions 
and identifying those to make it easier for all residents across Stratford to participate in climate action and also increase the education that we provide on climate change and, and the kinds of actions that local residents are able to do. There is a desire to increase your forested areas and renaturalize parts of the community. Um, increasing the walkability and decreasing urban sprawl was also a major point brought up. Um, increasing the connectivity as well within the county and the city and between the surrounding municipalities, particularly mentioned were Kitchener, London, and Toronto. And then to protect and support local agricultural land. And finally, to increase the cycling infrastructure to increase safety um, through the city and across the county as well. And so the next steps will be, be to review the climate plan with my management committee to make any final edits and revisions so that I can return to council for your support and buy-in and so we can move forward on community climate action. Thank you very much for having me. I look forward to meeting with you again soon. Thank you, Rebecca. Councillor Henderson, a question. Hey, I have um uh, uh, I have a few questions here and uh my first one is that in 2006, we um, set a target of 20% reduction for corporation and 6% by the community to be done by 2014. My understanding is that was done and that was from based on data from 2003. Since then, I think it was in 2012, the methane gas landfill was put there. So I, I was trying to find the percentage of reduction that that did capturing that methane gas, gas and burning it off. So I guess my biggest question is, because we're setting our target at 2017 and saying 10%, a lot of people in our community think that that's way too low, when in fact other communities are setting their targets based on the 1990 rate. So we would be probably, I'm sort of estimating, probably actually going for 40% if we wanted to start at say 1990, or even if we wanted to start at our 2003 rate, because I know in 2001, we brought the anti idling bylaw in and there was um, efficiencies that were done, you know, at um, the Almond Arena and uh, Rotary Complex and all the different things that we've been doing, the solar panels that have been put up in the city. And um, I just question why we're picking 2017 because I think that's very um, confusing or what I want to say misleading or I'm not sure what the right word is to the members of the community because they think we're not setting our targets high enough. So I'm wondering if we should have based ours on what other communities are doing, say 1990 and they can say they're doing 30% when in reality they might only be doing two or 4% based on the 2017 rate. I'm not sure if you can answer that today, but. Ms. Garlick, do you have a response to that? Uh, through the speaker, yes, I do. Um, so the 2017 baseline year was chosen uh, because our utility companies are only able to provide data um, that far back. Um, so I wasn't able to collect any information prior to 2017 for electricity or natural gas consumption on the more granular level. Um, I did backcast based on the previous emission totals um, that Ontario has put out. And the 10% reduction target would align us with the provincial and national targets. I know it's, it can be a little confusing, but that does, it, it will align us with, with their 30% um, reduction target based on the 1990. Um, but yes, I agree. It can be, it, the emission uh, calculations can be pretty confusing. Uh, with the various different baseline years. Um, does that answer your question? So basically what you're saying is if we go for the 10% reduction, we're actually going for around 30 to 40% if we went back on the baseline and get as cities are. Is that correct in saying that? That's correct, yes. Thank you. If I could, and before Councillor Vasilakos, Rebecca, is there any way that we could show both so that people could see in parallel what a 1990 reduction and a 2017 so that we could clarify if there is any misunderstanding between people? Yep, I can definitely get that together for you and, and present that. Okay, Councillor Vasilakos. 
So um, I just wanted to, to, to sort of go over. So, so Ms. Garlick, what you're working on right now is a community action plan. So these are numbers for our entire community, which in, includes individuals, businesses, and the municipal and municipal operations combined into um, a single target. Is that correct? That's correct. So the building emissions in the community um, inventory do include municipally owned buildings. Okay. So the other question that I had in terms of presenting it as a 10% target, is it possible? Because I think one of the things that I'm interested in is I'm not so I'm interested in sort of absolute change over time. So it would be nice to see the 1990 and 2017 and, and what the different benchmarks are and are, what they are as a percentage. But I'm also interested in understanding, um, you know, what does 10% look like? What does 20% look like? What does 30% look like? Um, what what are what's easily achievable? What requires a little extra work? And what um, requires us to make some sig sig significant, um, you know, action? And so I think that you know I, I'm not a really huge fan of aspirational goals that you can't hit. But I am interested in if there's a stretch goal there. So if 10% of 2017, which is roughly 30% of 1990 or whatever that looks like, what does 15% look like? And is that a is that a reasonable stretch goal that we can if if we if the resources come along, if federal funding comes along, if our community gets behind us with with education, what does that look like? What does 20% look like? So that we're always looking that. That, that, that we're doing the baseline, but we're stretching to what is possible beyond that. And I'm wondering if that's something that you, I don't, I, you know, this is just, I'm bouncing off the top of my head, but if this is something that you think would be um, presentable in a community action plan. Through the speaker. Um, yeah, I absolutely think that you can for sure increase your reduction target. Um, I did get a, because of the survey, um, the community could set a reduction target. The minimum that I set was the 10% because ideally we wanna be meeting our provincial and national targets. Um, the community voted on about a 30% reduction target um, for 2030. This is a very ambitious target. Um, it will require a lot of capital, um, but there are a lot of funding opportunities coming forward from the federal government. Um, as we've heard, the They've set a pretty ambitious target for 2050 and are, have uh, put forward a new climate plan. So there's definitely going to be funding opportunities coming forward from the federal government over the coming few years. Um, so I think that will definitely increase the opportunity to, to maybe aim higher, I guess, is the best term. And, and, and so if I could follow up with that, um, I think one of the things that we've found in the past is the government always gives money when you have a plan ahead of time and when you have projects that are ready. So I guess my view of this is if we had sort of some aspirational projects that we could do if the money came along, we could jump on those opportunities faster than, than if, we're, if we're just sort of going along with, with the, the baseline amount. Councillor Burbeck, then Councillor Gaffney. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for your presentation. Um, I agree with Councillor Vasilakos. I, I would like to see some more data so that we can make a, a more informed decision about our target rate. Um, I just wanted to point out that provincial targets and the federal targets are kind of a minimum target. And by uh, global standards, they, they are being criticized not being quite enough. So we also need to take that into consideration that uh, do we want to just hit the, the absolute minimum that we need to or can we achieve, are we, is it achievable for us to, to aim a little bit higher um, so that we can get a little further, a little faster um, and then that will bring us closer to our 2050 target. Rebecca? Through the speaker, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, our targets for our federal and provincial um, governments have definitely received a lot of criticism. And I would say that our federal target is not on track to reach our 30% our, uh, reduction target for 2030. So, you know, if our municipalities are wanting to be more ambitious and kind of lead the way on that, um, I would definitely 
obviously be happy to hear that as a climate coordinator. Great. Councillor Gaffney. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, I'd like to uh, thank and congratulate Rebecca on, on, for me personally, as someone with a limited amount of knowledge on these, these things, I have been educated and I hope uh, others in the community uh, take the report as a bit of education and a better understanding. And I'd like to move that the Stratford Emission Profile presented by Rebecca Garlick be received for information, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gaffney, a seconder for that. Councillor Seven, did you have your hand up? Okay. Is there anyone else wish to speak to this at this time? Councillor Clifford. Yeah, I, I'd like to ask, um, there's obviously grants from Ottawa, but I'd like to know if we do talk about 10, 15 or 30%, what kind of annual cost is there to the municipality? I, I know we don't know about the grants, but obviously, um, you know, climate change is important, but also what, what our constituents have to pay for taxes. So we, 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 are, we are paying the carbon tax through natural gas and gasoline. So I think we also need a comprehensive financial report on this. Thanks, Councillor Clifford. I believe Ms. Thompson uh, and the corporate leadership team would be looking at that as well as it looks to different infrastructure programs. Any, Councillor Bunting, I saw your hand. Yeah, through you, Your Worship. Um, just a question with regarding uh, increased population, more people, more houses, more cars. Uh, as the population grows, is that statistic taken into consideration uh, when when people can say we have met our target or we have fallen short of our char target, uh, how, how does that factor in or does it? Sorry, can you repeat that? Okay. Sorry. Try, um, my question would be, is the growing population with the more people, more cars, more houses, uh, say, for instance, in the city of Stratford, the city of Stratford will grow. I realize it's growing by a, a fairly small number every year, but at the same time, over the course of 10, 15 years, it will certainly grow, and uh, the housing will, and therefore the, the, is those numbers taken into consideration when you come to deciding whether you've met your target or not? That's my point. Uh, through the speaker. Yes, they would be included in that. So if you increase the number of houses that you have in the city of Stratford over the coming years and they aren't either offset or considered a carbon neutral building, um, those would go towards an increase in your, your local emissions. So um, you, we would have to work on ways to reduce the um, inevitable increase in emissions from increased population. Thank you. Anything further? If not, we've uh, had a motion moved by Councillor Gaffney and second by Councillor Seven. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed to any? That's carried. Thank you. Through your worship, returning to your agenda, item seven is orders of the day and item 7.1 is a resolution regarding the Stratford Greenhouse Gas Emissions Planning Report. And if you'll turn to your agenda, following publishing of the agenda, the following persons requested to address council on this matter. And there is a motion that the presentations by Mike Sullivan and Ann Carbert be heard. A mover, Councillor Vasilakos and Councillor Burback. All those in favor? Opposed to any, and it's carried. Hello. Mike. Hi, Mike. Can you hear us? I can. Thank you very much. Great. Mr. Sullivan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm not going to be long. Um, I am now on the Energy and Environment Committee and first heard of a 10% target at our last meeting, asked questions uh, to, as to how we got there and uh, was... Uh, in receipt of a document sent by uh, the deputy clerk, uh, which was a, what I will call a Hill report. It was a report set in 
was uh, written in 2008. Um, and the city at, in that report set a target for the community of 6% below actual 2003 emissions. And it set a target for corporate, meaning city owned buildings and facilities of 20% below 2003 emissions. Um, in that report drafted in 2008, it noted that by 2005, community emissions had dropped by some 20%. And by 2005, corporate emissions had dropped by about 11%. Yet it didn't use 2005 as the base year. It used 2003. So in the report, essentially, it said, congratulations, public, you've reached your target for 2014. You've reached it already by 20, 2005. And congratulations, city, you're more than halfway there. In fact, here's some departments that can actually raise their emissions. And at the back of the report, you'll see a number of departments of the city that um, were below the uh, amount of emissions that they needed to reach in 2014. And so they could raise their emissions, which was a completely backwards, in my view, way to approach reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. This was in large measure because the province of Ontario had, between 2003 and 2005, eliminated the use of coal. And so the coefficient of greenhouse gas emissions attached to electricity was significantly reduced between 2003 and 2005. And the city quite conveniently chose 2003 because then they didn't have to do as much work, nor did the public. So by 2014, we were still above 2005 emissions, but it didn't matter because we were below 2003. This kind of uh, shell game with, with years is something I would hope that the council doesn't want to continue with targets and years and uh, base years and, and targets that don't make sense. What, what ought to be happening is that there ought to be a concerted effort on the part of council and in turn the citizens of the city to actually reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And in keeping with what is being said by the UN through the UN Committee on Climate Change and through the agreement by Canada to agree to the Paris targets, the essence of those targets are 2005 as a base year, not 1990, not 2003 but 2005, and that our emissions need to be 30% below 2005 by 2030. And originally it was to be 80% below 2005 by 2050. Although now our government has said we will be carbon neutral by 2050, which means we will absorb as much carbon as we emit, while not suggesting we're going to stop emitting entirely. Um, so the city, uh, there were a, a whole lot of recommendations in that report, in that 2008 report. Um, the recommendations for the community were essentially educational, just teaching people about what greenhouse gas emissions are and how to reduce them, but no specific actual uh, documented way of saying to the residents of the city that the greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced by if you do X, Y, and Z. Um, in, in terms of the city recommendations, the biggest one, of course, was flaring methane gas at the at the dump. And that was done in 2012, I think I heard Councillor Henderson say. And so the city met its target easily by just that one action. But there were a number of other recommendations for the city to do. Among them, its transportation fleet. Among them, it's uh, some air conditioning and heating in some of the city buildings. I have yet to find out whether any of those recommendations were actually performed or whether they were just, uh, you know, things on a piece of paper back in 2008 that nobody paid attention to afterwards. I don't know. Um, the other thing facing Canada is, of course, Alberta. And so because Alberta is going to be permitted to actually increase its emissions by 40 megatons, it means everybody else in Canada has to reduce by that amount. So each individual has to reduce by a ton in order to allow Alberta to continue 
could raise its emissions. That's never been talked about publicly, but that's really what's going to happen. So our targets outside of Alberta need to be actually higher than the 30%. Couldn't tell you exactly how much because I don't have a calculator in front of me. Finally, the, the city doesn't intend to stand still. There are plans for growth. There are lands that are going to be turned into housing, and those plans are well known. And so the growth rate that has continued of between 0.6 and 0.8% for the past 20 years is likely to continue. And unless the new people coming to Stratford aren't permitted any greenhouse gas emissions, the rest of us will have to reduce by still more, more than whatever percentage is set by this council today or in whatever method you do it. So that growing the economy of Stratford means reducing greenhouse gas emissions more than you planned in order to offset greenhouse gas emissions that are being that will certainly be generated by new people coming to the city, unless, as I say, they're not permitted any greenhouse gas emissions, and I don't think you, you've declared that. So on a personal basis, I would recommend that Stratford adapt a much more aggressive target of no less than 30%. And that 30%, I mean, you can go back and look at that Hill report, and it's got a number for 2005. If you want to attach a 30% reduction from 2005, the difficulty is Rebecca's numbers don't reflect all of the same things that were in the 2005 report. So it's hard to tell where exactly that would be. But 10% is certainly not enough. Um, and that a, a much more aggressive target be part of the motion that's before you now, if necessary, converted to the 2017 figures. But as a member of the Energy and Environment Committee, we were not able to actually see Rebecca's report or to see all of the other, uh, the, the staff report at our last meeting. And so another way to handle this is that council defer the target setting until such time as the committee has had an opportunity to review the coordinator's report. And we will then make a recommendation to the city about what year would be the base year and what would be an appropriate target for the city. When you look at the where the greenhouse gas emissions come from and the fact that we have to be carbon neutral by 2050, that's not a lot of time left. Really only 30 years in which we will not have any automobiles that will be running green uh, gasoline, either corporately or in, in, the, uh, in the public. Our houses will have to be heated by greenhouse gas free electricity. Now, the city of Stratford has its own electricity company, which is going to put it in an advantageous position because it will be able to set the price and to generate electricity in such a way as to offset the fact that these homes are going to have to switch from natural gas to electricity. That's the only way that this homes, businesses, and the city itself is going to have to switch from natural gas to electricity in order to be carbon neutral by 2030. That is not a, or 2050, sorry. And that is not a process that's going to take just a handful of years in 2045. That's a process that's going to need to start now. And without some kind of vision of what the city of Stratford is going to look like in terms of electricity generation and uh, natural gas reduction, it's not going to be possible to meet any uh, carbon neutral target in 2050 unless you start now. So I would ask that the committee, that the council, uh, your worship, I would ask council to consider deferring a decision until such time as the Energy and Environment Committee have had a chance to look at it and provide some more uh, guidance as to what is really an appropriate target for the city of Stratford. And I thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Any questions for Mr. Sullivan? If not, uh, Ms. Carbert, are you there? You should be able to hear me now. I pressed what I needed to press. Hi, Ann. I can hear you now. Hello. Excellent. Thank you. 
Mayor Matheson, City Councillors, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And I'm so pleased to see so much detailed Stratford-specific information in the two climate reports that you're receiving today. I know a lot of work went into both of those reports, and I thank the Climate Change Coordinator for her report and the city staff members for the work they have done, as well as the volunteers from the community and from the Energy and Environment Advisory Committee who contributed to the city staff report. I spoke at City Council meeting about a year ago when you were set to vote on the Climate Emergency Declaration. And today I had the same sense of emergency and urgency about the climate crisis, and I remain committed to local action and the difference it can make at this critical time for our planet. I am speaking again now because I'm concerned about the 10% greenhouse gas emission reduction target in the proposed motion for today. And I would like our community to get moving on a plan and work towards significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. But it makes sense to me that you wait on this particular motion until the climate change coordinator can present her climate action plan, which I understand is now being reviewed by city department directors. As you know, her plan is a plan for the county with specific sections and recommendations for each municipality, including for the city of Stratford. And while the management report you received indicates that the 10% target was set in consultation with the climate change coordinator, as you purchased now, very briefly, she has uh, also other information from her online public consultation and her plan will include proposed actions. I hope you will receive her climate action plan very soon and any other information that will help you consider what kind of target will ensure that we respond to the climate emergency with ambition, that our community does its fair share and more if possible for significant greenhouse gas reductions by 2030, and that we inspire local re residents to get on board and do their part as well. I do understand the difference in data baselines for this, th that the staff report notes, because municipalities refer to different years when stating their percentage targets, the percentages alone aren't comparable. Toronto's 65% reduction goal is impressive until you realize that they are using 1990 data as their baseline. Fair enough. But I think, given that we are in a climate emergency, we need to consider what we can actually achieve going forward. Are there reductions that are fairly easily achieve achievable beyond a 10% target? I will offer three quick examples that I hope will help to illustrate how we might approach this. First, I hope all of you participated in the public consultation that the climate change coordinator had online for a month late last year. It was a simulator. As I went through the sections on transportation, buildings, waste, and other sources of emissions for Perth County, I was offered some choices about actions to take and how much action for each choice I made. A calculator on the side of the page kept a tally showing the tons of emissions that would be reduced if my choices were implemented, and it also considered the difficulty level of the plan that I was creating. After making my choices, I was one of those ones that I guess Rebecca was just referring to. I had a Perth County climate plan action plan with a 30% emissions reduction target that did not exceed the difficulty level for a municipal plan that the simulator um, indicated. What we are being asked to do in the simulator there and in real life is make some choices about what we want to do and how much. Can we have more calculations on um, tonnage reductions for specific city actions so we can make those choices. I'm not convinced that 10% represents the limit of what's possible in an affordable, doable action plan and target for 2030. We can make more ambitious choices. As a second consideration, a climate writer I follow wonders if we shouldn't focus so much on percentage targets at all, because over decades of negotiations and government commitments, we haven't met the targets that were set and the crisis has intensified. He asks, what if we just did all that we could? As an example, we don't see firefighters showing up at a fire and projecting that they will save three of the five people inside the house. They try to save everyone they can. And I think if we are taking the climate emergency seriously, we must at least ask as we consider a target, what can we do to mitigate greenhouse gas gases as much as possible by 2030 and get us well on our way to carbon neutrality by 2050 or sooner. And lastly, I have gratitude and empathy for the fact that you are governing in an emergency on top of an emergency. I'm very glad that you've taken an emergency response to the pandemic. 
You have consulted with experts, coordinated with public health, businesses, schools, social services, and many more. You've endeavored to communicate clearly and frequently with residents and make it clear what we all must do to stay safe. You have facilitated creative solutions for service delivery, for local businesses, community activities, and more. You have been doing all that you can. And again, I think to take the climate emergency seriously, we need this kind of coordination, communication, and creativity. And we need a sense that we are doing all that we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, not just what is perceived to be manageable or a minimum target. In conclusion, I know from my volunteer work around climate awareness and action in Stratford, many, many community members are ready to take significant climate action and support the city to do its part. And I know you've heard from passionate local youth climate activists who are very committed to seeing significant action in Stratford. They are aware that this is a critical time for action right now. And the target we set now and how we understand our ambition for 2030 will make a big difference for their future. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Is there any questions for Ms. Carbert? Uh, Councillor Henderson. I was wondering, Anne, what your thoughts are on this. Of um, Instead of saying that the city set a 10% emissions reduction target based on 2017 levels, that we set a minimum of 10,000 emissions reduction target with the idea that we will endeavor to do more. I'm not sure exactly the wording on that, but at least have a minimum target that we can start with and get going on things, but that we can increase over time and, and show more. I mean, we did have the mayor, David Mayberry, come and speak again. And, you know, they have net zero in their area that they're working hard for. And what did he say? Like, they're reducing 4.5% a year. Plus, well, himself, he gave what he has done himself, how he's gone less than 50% of his own target. I forget all the rates were, but they're from 2008 up to now, how he's got himself down so low just by doing changes in his own life. And I know there's many in our community that already do that. They've switched all their lights in their house over to LED. They've put, um, you know, things on their shower heads and their, their taps to reduce amount of water waste. And there's many people that have switched to hybrid or electric cars already, not a lot, but still some. And, um, you know, that people are, you know, even the fact of not idling, you don't need to have brand new cars, don't even need 30 seconds, you just start out slowly. So there's a lot of people in our community that are already doing things and are well aware of it. But I would hate for us not to set some kind of minimum, at least at this one, 10%, um, Rebecca has said, is um, meeting the minimum standard of the province and the targets that are set. I think federally too, but um, but that doesn't mean we can't do more. And I think our community will do more. And we've already proved a couple of times that when we've brought things to council and and I think where the shortfall was is that we didn't have somebody to carry it on, like climate change coordinator that ensures that once we've done one section, it doesn't just sit, it keeps going forward. I just wonder what your thoughts are on just maybe changing the motion to say that a, we would start out with a minimum of 10% to increase it over the years. I guess my initial response to that is raising your target as a minimum isn't very inspiring. And if we already have people on board, as you say, many families and households doing what they can, I know the city is working on things that, that some of us aren't up to date on and that there were climate um, initiatives considered in your recent uh, budget discussions that we may not all have followed or seen as climate initiatives. There, there, there are things going on. Um, I, I guess I just fear that uh, if what's passed is wording of a minimum 10% target, that's not much to grab onto. Um, um, a, a bolder target I think we could rally around a bit more. And um, if you can pull together what's being presented as um, potential initiatives for a plan, well, what the city staff has pulled together there, what we expect Rebecca will present with her climate action plan soon. Um, 
I think we should have a better idea of what's within reach and what's ambitious. And I keep using that word, but I I think we need to be thinking in that sense, given the emergency context. And I don't know that passing a motion, maybe we won't refer to the motion much, so it doesn't really matter, but passing a motion with a wording of minimum 10% uh, target, um, I don't know if that pushes us along the way we need to to be going. Thank you, Ann. Any, anyone else wishing to speak at this time? If not, thank you very much to Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Carbert. And uh, Madam Clerk, we'll go to the next item. So through your worship, returning back to your agenda, there is a staff recommendation uh, that the corporate and community initiatives identified in this report be adopted in principle subject to a more fulsome review by staff at the direction of council to outline individual implementation plans with specific budget and resource impacts identified that staff be directed to investigate and report back within three months on the following initiatives which could commence in 2021 a review of the idling bylaw electric vehicle charging stations and corporate adoption of one planet living principles that the city of Stratford set a 10% emissions reduction target based on 2017 levels by the year 2030, and that staff be directed to enter into a new local partnership agreement with the municipality of North Perth, municipality of West Perth, township of Perth East, township of Perth South, county of Perth, and the town of St. Mary's for the shared services of the climate change coordinator for the period of March 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2021, with the potential for extension in 2022. And through your worship, it is my understanding Deputy Clerk Chris Bantock is available to address any questions um, and may have some opening remarks uh, for council's consideration. All right, Mr. Bantock. Through your worship, uh, this report was prepared in response to motion passed by council last year that referred a number of items to staff to report back on related to reducing the city's greenhouse gas emissions. At a high level, the report before you today identifies a number of corporate and community initiatives, a 2030 reduction target of 10% and a recommended way forward. It is also noted that all initiatives included in this report have only been addressed at a high level and will require further direction from council to staff for investigation before moving ahead. Touching specifically on reduction target of 10% by 2030, as Rebecca Garlic noted, staff understand this appears as a lower percentage than would be seen from other municipalities and levels of government due to the change in baseline years. The recommended target from staff has received support from the climate change coordinator and other partner municipalities across the county as a feasible target to reach in the next 10 years. This report and the setting of a reduction target is an important milestone in the framework for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. As noted on page four of this report, the Partners for Climate Protection campaign recommends setting a reduction target prior to the development and implementation of an action plan. And following this way forward, it would be best practice that an established target approved by council helps to guide the plan and not the plan guiding the target. Setting this target now does not mean that we cannot revisit more ambitious targets as we approach 2030 and will allow for time to study the effects of our efforts towards reducing emissions and what is believed to be feasibly reached moving forward. I would also like to quickly thank everyone that was involved in putting this report together. It was a collaborative effort with contributions from many staff across various divisions, as well as the members of the Energy and Environment Advisory Committee who finalized the proposed community initiatives and provided comments on the report as a whole. I'd also like to express our gratitude to the shared climate change coordinator, Rebecca Garlick, we would not be where we are today without her and the expertise she's provided to us throughout this process so far. Lastly, with respect to the extension of Rebecca's contract, FCM has noted that even though the contract end date is February 28, 2021, Rebecca did not start her role until April of 2019, which actually places an expiration date on the MSIP program for us until March 31st, 2021. FCM has also advised of a potential extension to the program as they want to ensure that all grant recipients have the full two years to fulfill their obligations under the contract. Should the Government of Canada approve this extension, the project would be extended until February 28, 2022. In the event that the program extension is not approved, FCM has created a workaround option to increase the funding ratio to 100% until March 31st, 2021, and have the partner municipalities contribute their 20% after the March 31st, 2021 deadline which as staff understand should allow us to extend the project by a couple of months. 
Overall, this should end up reducing the city's costs that have been previously allocated towards this contract through the 2021 budget. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bantuck. I have Councillor Vazalakos and Councillor Burbeck and Councillor Engel. So um, first of all, I wanna thank um, both Rebecca and, and staff for the reports. What I really like about the reports is taken together between Rebecca's quantitative analysis of where we are and where we need to go. And staff, the staff report, while it doesn't actually provide a lot of quantitative analysis in terms of numbers, and it does actually um, define the scope of what's, what we should be looking at within the corporation. And so there's two pieces to this, as I see, there's a community action plan and there's corporate initiatives that can actually contribute to our corporate targets. And part of the reason why I'm opposed to setting that 10% as because it's a bare minimum is that those could be different. The community action plan could set a higher target. The city, I believe, could set a higher target. But in the absence of doing a little bit more work, waiting for Rebecca to come back with her action plan for the community, waiting for staff to, I would be interested, there's some really interesting ideas in the staff report around what we could do to address um, climate change, but we don't have any numbers necessarily attached to it. So I realized that an, a setting a target um, can, can drive the work we do. I still think we need to understand the scope of the work that we're gonna do to help us decide on that target. And so I think there's a little bit more work that needs to be done between Rebecca's report that's coming and also a little bit more fleshing out of some of those initiatives that city staff have actually targeted to understand whether 10%, I think 10% is low hanging fruit. I would be very interested in coming back and giving staff and Rebecca an opportunity to come back and tell us, this is our baseline low hanging fruit what some what are again what are some stretch goals what are things that we can add so that we have some options where we can go from 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 and what does that look like and i'd be even interested in something that says we can do 10 percent within three years but in four years when we start to build out our our let's say fleet and go electric it's going to bump it up like i i think a little forecasting is needed um and i realize that Rose work back, but I think Energy and Environment Committee could help as well. So that's my long way of saying that I would like to approve, I would like to move that we do continue Rebecca's contract. Um, and I am interested in the report back on those three items that are listed, but I would like to defer any decision around the target and some of those other corporate and community initiatives until there's been a little bit more work coordinating between Rebecca's coming report um, before we decide on that target. That's just my view of it. And I have one more thing to say that I think Councillor Rebecca. So you're proposing a deferral, which we do under the procedural bylaw, uh, allow a deferral motion with the items listed. Is there a seconder for that? And we'll put it on the floor. Councillor Burback, thank you. Um, if do you want us to have others speak to your motion that you've made, Councillor, or do you want to finish up with your last point? Um, I just wanted to make a point around, um, there were some questions around what else has the city done and I, I will go back to, I don't know that the corporation, as a corporation, I don't know that we actually um, sort of celebrate some of the things that we do do. We had an extensive LED lighting program that converted most of the lighting. We bought an electric ice resurfacing, so I didn't call it a sample, ice resurfacing machine. We've done, you know, within our budgets, we do put a climate change lens on some of the, 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 the operational and capital things that we do. And I don't know that we've actually incorporated enough of those things into the report that's before council to sort of show the public that even though we don't have a formal detailed plan, we do continue to incorporate those things into our operations. And, I, and that's just, I think it came up when Mr. Sullivan was talking about what else have you done? And there, there are things that we've done. There's a green roof on an arena. So those kinds of things. Councillor Burback, I saw your hand next and Councillor Ingram and Councillor Henderson. Thank you. Uh, I would echo a lot of what Councillor Vasilakos has said. And um, I do think we need to take some time to uh, flesh out a plan a little bit more and also look at the, the targets that we want to set because that, that will set the tone for the next 
uh, nine years. Um, I really did like the report though. I thought that staff did a great job. Um, some of the things that I really liked were the green development standards um, and the corporate adap adapt adoption of the one planet living principles. I thought those, that, that's excellent. We're moving in the right direction for sure with, with those. Um, so what I would like to, to hear is, um, I would like to hear from the Energy and Environment Committee um, who now have all the information that we have, these reports, and we'll be able to, to have a fulsome discussion on it. And uh, people there are very um, skilled and have a lot of background. Many people have background in some of these areas that can give us more information. So I think it's really important for us to hear from energy and environment as well. Um, and hear Rebecca's next presentation that will give us a lot more information on, on what the community feels is possible and the direction that they would like to go in as well. A um, couple of things about uh, what we've already done, even since uh, 2017, we have adopted a green bin program and Rebecca did make note of that, that it would be very interesting to see what reduction has already come from an initiative that's, that's just new. Um, that's already getting us part of the way towards that 10%. Um, if we go ahead with the RNG project, then that's another large offset. So th these are important things to also take note of. We have already invested in a green bin program. Um, so that money is already spent and we're already uh, seeing the good result of that. So I do think it's important to take a little bit more time to uh, thoroughly consider what, what our targets should be and they should be achievable, but also inspirational. And that's gonna be the, the balance that we're gonna have to try to strike, which is gonna be interesting, but I think we can do it. We can pull together the information. We have a lot of interest in the community uh, for helping us get to those targets. So um, yeah, I would, I would like to see us when Rebecca reports, it brings her next report forward with the community information that we would also then have a discussion about the target that we might set. Thank you. Councilor Ingram, Henderson, and then Clifford. Thank you. So, so my questions are more uh, process related, and I'm I'm wondering if someone can explain the difference between what our deputy clerk and the staff report has worked on and put forward versus what Rebecca is working on and putting forward, because it seems to me that there's a little bit of an overlap there, and I'm not sure the where the the line and the roles and the responsibilities um, are crossing over. And I think it would be helpful for all of us, plus the members of the public, to understand. The difference between why this report is coming from staff and not from Rebecca. Okay, um, maybe Deputy Clerk uh, uh, Chris Bantock could answer that question best. For your worship, uh, so the staff report from uh, staff came back as a result of a uh, motion last year uh, that we were asked to report on uh, certain strategies and initiatives that could be brought forward to reduce emissions. Um, they largely relate to uh, corporate initiatives uh, with community initiatives that were put together by the Energy and, uh, and Environment Advisory Committee. The emissions report uh, from Rebecca, um, as was mentioned earlier, is uh, more of a, or sorry, the, the climate uh, plan that's being drafted is more of a wholesome uh, approach to, uh, from a county perspective that will have individual sections for each municipality. The emissions profile, um, as I understand, is a section uh, that was done as a result of work for that plan uh, and was brought forward as a Stratford specific uh, to um, collaborate with the report that staff were bringing forward just to provide that uh, the quantitative and the qualitative analysis, uh, just because uh, Rebecca has been able to provide a lot of that uh, expertise and background, whereas um, staff unfortunately don't have um, a lot of that expertise to provide. Councillor Ingram, do you have anything else on that? Thank you. So, so I guess just to be clear, there's no overlap of work. You are working in collaboration with Rebecca and uh, Rebecca is working on the overall community plan. You're working on corporate specific strategies. Through your worship, that's, that's correct. Uh, Rebecca has been available uh, just to collaborate uh, with what we're bringing forward. Thank you. Right, is there uh, Councillor Henderson? You were next, then Councillor Clifford. 
But I just like um, Councillor Vakalos's uh, deferral on the motion. Is it just the deferral on the ten percent? The rest would go forward. So just remove um, the paragraph that says about the ten percent. But we'll still vote on the rest of the motion. Is that right? Councillor Vasilakos, was that your intent? Everybody. My intent was to go forward with the three initiatives back within three months and uh, going ahead with um, Ms. Garlick's uh, extension of her contract. I would like to take that per first piece with the com corporate and community initiatives identified in the report. I'd like to pull those out a little bit as well as the target because I think the two of those go together in, in um, helping us put together a target that or, or a reduction target. So um, it's sort of the, the first item and the third item I'm deferring, and the second and the last item we'll vote on. I'll look to the clerk. Ms. Defoe, do you follow with that? Okay. Ms. Defoe has that clearly, so she's prepared to separate those when time comes. I, I, I just like clarification on the first paragraph. Why you feel that isn't important that we start on that? Um, the, the, there are items listed there um, reviewing the item bylaw and the electric vehicle charging and the, and the adoption of one planet living principles. I think those we can decide on today. Those are things that we can go ahead on. I think what I, I'm looking at when it says the corporate and community initiatives identified in the report adopted in principle, um, there's nothing wrong with adopting them in principle, but what I'm hoping is, is that when Rebecca's report comes back on community actions, and if we can flesh out a little bit more of the, 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 the corporate initiatives and what, they, what, what targets we could achieve and some quant a little bit more quantitative analysis on those, those two pieces, if we get reports back on those, um, we may be able to set a better target. And I think, I think that's, that's what, and, and it goes back to like Councillor Burbeck just said, we already have a green bin program that already contributes something to that 10%. Should we be setting that 10% differently just on the realization that we've already covered something? So I just think there's a little bit more work required in that first piece to put some numbers and scale to the initiatives so we can make a, a, a more informed decision on the target. And I thought that's what that first paragraph meant, that they're to come back with a wholesome budget and targets. And I thought that's what that was all about for them to do that. I guess I'm misunderstanding that. When we get to the breakdown of the motion, we can go through those. Councillor Clifford, you're up next. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, what I would like to know from even in Best Drafford, uh, to increase our tax base, we have to grow our commercial and industrial base. I, I'd like to have input from like every time we have a plant coming and all this, I'd like that to be part of the equation because we, we do, we, we, we have a concern about greenhouse gas. We also have a concern about our tax base and growing industry and commercial. So I would like to at least have something from Invest Strafford as part of this equation, like how we can go ahead, be, be environmentally um, be aware of it, but also be aware of the growth, both commercially and industrial. So industrially. So I'd like to have something. It's easy to say we have an emergency plan. We, we do. We have a climate emergency. We have this and that, but we still want growth in the city. So I, I, I think we what we're doing is it's important, but it's not the whole story. So I'd like to see something a bit more comprehensive in that light. I, I believe when staff review this, they'll They'll consult the outside agency as well. All right, now I'll turn it back to the clerk then and she can walk us through the, the subsequent motions or the subsets. It's agreed that or believed that the mover and seconder have uh, moved all of these and that's Councillor Vasilakos and Councillor Burback. And if that changes, just let us know, but I'll turn it over to the clerk. So through your worship, it is my understanding that Councillor Vasilakos and Councillor Burback have moved and seconded that the staff be directed to investigate and report back within three months on the following initiatives, which could commence in 2021, and that staff be directed to enter into a new local partnership agreement. So that would be the first motion on the floor. All right, 
It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on that? All those in favor? Opposed to any, that's carried. Next item. So through you, your worship, it's my understanding the following has been requested to be deferred. And that would be that the corporate and community initiatives identified in this report be adopted in principle subject to a more fulsome review by staff at the direction of council to outline individual implementation plans with specific budget and resource impacts identified and that staff oh, and that the city of Stratford set a 10% emissions reduction target based on 2017 levels by the year 2030. That deferral has been moved by Councillor Vazilakos and Burback, seconding Councillor Henderson. I'm so confused about the first paragraph. Why don't we want them um, coming back with a full summary review and we're directing them to do that and to outline plans with specific budgets and resource impacts identified. What, what's Vaz the reason for that? I don't understand that. Councillor Vazilakos. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it other than um, in looking at um, what the ramifications of each of those might be, we might consider that our target is too low or we need to be more ambitious or there's the more that we can do. There, I think my point is, is, is before we go ahead and adopt something in principle, we might be wanting to adopt something more in principle. We may want to look at that target and say, that's not high enough we need to look at some more and we need to expand what staff are looking at. So I, 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 I'm, just, I'm just thinking that before we go ahead and decide that, let's get some more information back and let's wait and see what Ms. Garlic comes back with in terms of community initiatives as well. All right, that is the reason for the motion of the deferral. It's been moved and seconded. Seeing no other hands, all those in favor? Opposed, if any. And that's carried, thank you. And the last item, Ms. Defoe. So through your worship, it's my understanding we are moving on to item 7.2, which is a resolution regarding a planning report on draft plan of subdivision 31T19-001 and zone change application Z09-19 at 236 Britannia Street. It is my understanding the planner on the file has a presentation. Following that presentation, we will be moving to the addenda to uh, receive the emotion that the presentation by Kirsten Barrisdale of GSB Group be heard. A mover to hear Ms. Barrisdale, Councillor Gaffney and Councillor Bunting. All those in favor? Opposed to any and that's carried. Ms. Barrisdale, are you there? I am. Your worship, if we could hear from the planner first and then Ms. Barrisdale, that would be appreciated. Okay, we'll go in that order and we'll start with the staff planner and then we'll go to Ms. Barrisdale. Thank you, Your Worship. And good evening, uh, Your Worship, members of council. Uh, as you recall, we received an application for a plan of subdivision that could occur in zone change in 2019. Uh, they had requested a mix of residential uses. They were single detached dwellings, semi detached dwellings, three townhouse dwellings, and cluster townhouse dwellings. Uh, we have presented a report to you. Uh, and as uh, members of the Planning and Heritage Committee in December of last year, and you had recommended uh, for approval of that uh, strap plan and zoning. And at the December 21st meeting, uh, you, the council recommended deferral of the application until the January 25th meeting of this year. At the January 25th meeting, uh, you had recommended that we not bring back a report until we've had a chance to consult with the uh, area residents into that in that when that uh, consultation is concluded. I'm here to say that the uh, those discussions and that consultation with the area residents has concluded and the applicant is requesting we bring a revised plan back to you. Just a reminder that this is a draft plan and the zone change on the former fairground lands or portion, excuse me, of the former fairground lands. It's 7.7 .7 hectares in size, uh, 19 acres. It has frontage on both on Britannia Street and it's surrounded by the rotary complex, single detached dwellings to the east and west, uh, as well as apartment buildings to the east and to the south. Uh, we had a telephone conference call 
with Airy Residence. Uh, that was uh, myself, the manager of planning, uh, Kirsten Barrisdale of GSP Group, the applicants, uh, um, Warner Bromberg Limited, and 13 members of staff. And at that uh, call, we had, uh, at the direction of the applicants, uh, three different options were presented. Uh, there was the original application, which had seven townhouse blocks. Each of those townhouse blocks were to contain uh, six townhouse dwelling units. And at the end of that run of blocks, of townhouse blocks, there would be one single detached dwelling. Uh, another option that we had presented was seven townhouse blocks. Each townhouse block would now contain only four townhouse dwellings. And uh, after that, they would be single detached dwellings. And then the second option was, again, seven townhouse blocks, each containing four units, two semi-detached dwellings that would total four units, and five single-detached dwellings. So option one would contain 43 units. Option two would contain 36 units. Option three would contain 37 units. Uh, all of the units ended up uh, containing the minimum density required by the official plan special policy area number 16. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, none of the op three options that were presented were, uh, were uh, agreeable to the members, uh, the residents. They expressed concerns with all the options. Uh, they had concerns with locating townhouse dwellings on the west side of Street A, basically behind their properties. They continue to believe that the proposed height is too high uh, they expressed concerns about the massing of the townhouse dwellings. Uh, they're concerned that the subdivision will re result in the removal of trees, that will result in the loss of privacy, and result in a loss of their property values. One resident indicated that they uh, were prepared to appeal the decision uh, of council if it were approved with uh, townhouses as in the three options. Uh, the feedback we received from the conference call is similar to what we had received to the original circulation at the public meeting. And Mr. Chair, a copy of the minutes of the uh, conference call are attached to the report. So if you have any questions or would like information on those comments, uh, they're attached. Following the meeting with the area residents, the applicant formally requested option two uh, that they re their application formally be changed to option two. It would result in approximately 148 dwelling units in various forms and have a density of 31 units per hectare. Uh, this is different because the massing of the townhouses is uh, different. Uh, they are now smaller blocks. The blocks would contain four dwelling units as opposed to six. Uh, the run, as you'd like, of townhouse dwellings is shorter than it was previously. It's now going up to just... Uh, Street A, or sorry, it's no longer proposed north of Street B. And uh, it's also introduced new semi detached and single detached dwellings on the west side of Street A. Uh, we have evaluated the revised request on the, um, based on the same evaluation criteria we did the original plan of subdivision. We reviewed it in terms of suitability of the site. We reviewed it against the provincial policy statement, the official plan, including special policy area number 16. We reviewed the comprehensive zoning that was being requested, uh, how the revised applications uh, fit in with the agency response and with uh, the public response. Uh, it, it's our belief that the site is suitable for the revised plan, that it continues to conform to the provincial policy statement. The, uh, it conforms to the residential area policies of the official plan. Uh, that Those policies require us to provide a range of compatible housing types to meet the needs of the entire community. Uh, it also conforms to special policy area number 16. Uh, it does have a density greater than uh, 25 units per net hectare. We believe the future buildings will have a form, mask, and appearance that is consistent with the character of adjacent buildings. And through uh, site plan control, we can uh, address issues of uh, appearance. And as before, the subdivision will continue to have access to the rotary complex. Uh, the zoning we have reviewed and believe it to be appropriate for development of lands. It continues to uh, allow um, 11 meter maximum height, one meter than normally we would allow 
but the, an increase in height is necessary in this case to accommodate required grades for stormwater management. The special policy puts a limit on the percentage of the garage door as a as to of the entire front facade. This would allow for a two car uh, garage, but it makes sure that uh, we won't have garages that dominate the entire front facade, sort of the snout house look. Uh, the standard provisions of the zoning by law require that the minimum setback for a garage is six meters, thus allowing for uh, parking space uh, within the driveway. We've looked at the concerns of uh, area residents. Uh, we have conditions of draft approval dealing with fencing, with tree protection, uh, trees not on the subject lands, but on abutting property. Uh, we also have received concerns about uh, hydro service, and we have a condition that uh, requires uh, Festival High to sign off on the drawings before uh, finally approved. We have noticed that there, sorry, we have noticed that there's one error in the draft plan uh, that uh, block, what's labeled, labeled as block 47 should actually be block 74, and therefore we're recommending a red line revision to the draft plan. We are recommending uh, the following, uh, that the uh, original recommendation of the December, uh, that was, on, that was the original recommendation from uh, Planning Heritage Committee from December 14th be rescinded because we have a new uh, plan. Uh, the plan is, well, the changes uh, in our view do not require further notice. We're not recommending a new notice be required. We're recommending the zoning bylaw be amended to uh, from institutional future residential to a number of new residential zones, uh, two new first density uh, R1 zones, uh, one would allow a uh, height of 11 meters. The other one would allow a height of, I think it's 11.5 meters. We're uh, recommending approval of a um, second density zone. Um, we are recommending approval of special uh, residential fourth density zones. We're recommending approval of red line revision to the revised draft plan of subdivision. It would allow 54 single detached lots, eight semi-detached lots, 10 multi-residential blocks with two uh, walkways, a stormwater management pond served by two new local streets. Uh, we have uh, circulated the application. We have received comments from the public and uh, considered those comments when recommending and evaluating the conditions of draft approval and the zoning bylaw. Uh, it's consistent with the provincial policy statement we believe it conforms to the city of Stratford official plan, including special policy area number 16. We believe that draft plan and zoning would facilitate development that's appropriate for the lands and considered sound land use planning. And we believe it will meet the future housing needs of existing and future residents. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lunison. Uh, any questions from members of council before Ms. Barsdale speaks? Okay, uh, Ms. Barsdale, you're on the line. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Are Excellent. you making a presentation or just speaking to them? I'm just speaking to this. Okay, thank you. Um, I am just here to speak to um, uh, Mr. Lunison's presentations and comments with respect to the proposed draft plan subdivision and the subsequent changes that we've made. Um, as Mr. Lunison touched on, we, we did go through a number of back and forth with the city as well as residents, uh, exploring some different options and some different layout considerations, um, particularly as it related to the townhouse development. Um, we understood that there were some concerns from the public um, with regards to placement of the townhouses, height and potential massing of the townhouses. Um, 
as discussed previously and as requested, we did look at concepts that would include moving the townhouses central to the site. Um, and we played around with a number of different alternatives and different layouts. Unfortunately, because of the way the street pattern lays out, um, how we're bound to keep street A, the connection off of Britannia in because of the, um, the housing project that the city is working on at that corner. And then ultimately the connection to the Rotary Center, that center block is pretty much a fixed um, area of land. Uh, we did look at putting some townhouse units there, but we ran into some significant problems with grading, more as it relates to terracing, um, grading out from the rear of the units out to the street and making sure that we're getting appropriate drainage back there. Uh, we also ran into some um, significant um, overages, if you will, or surplus land and frontages that was created on the townhouse blocks, making it look rather um, it, did, it wasn't consistent with the rest of the pattern of the neighborhood. Uh, so the concepts that we had prepared for the city, uh, as Mr. Lunison touched on, provided for a reduction, first of all, in the overall townhouse block length to, in an attempt to reduce that massing and scaling as it appears to the residents on the north side of the property, or sorry, the west side of the property on Briar Hill. Uh, as a result of that reduction in the actual number of townhouse units per block, it does reduce the overall area or length of all of the townhouse blocks. Uh, and then uh, as a result of that reduction, we've intermixed some additional semi-detached as well as single detached housing. So it's really the development on that um, side of Street A that's sandwiched between Street A and Briar Hill that's changed. Um, everything else essentially remains the same on the draft plan. Um, I've had a chance to review the staff report, uh, along with the proposed um, modification to um, change the air that we made from a drafting perspective on the draft plan, as well as the zoning um, that Mr. Lunison has proposed, and we have no concerns or objections, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have um, with regards to the revised draft plans. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Barsdale? Councillor Burbeck? you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could explain again, uh, uh, I, I, this question might have been asked before, but I'm wondering about the townhouse blocks. Uh, could they not be placed so that they're backing out onto the, the stormwater pond uh, in, in another spot where they're not backing onto existing housing? Is, is there no, I know you explained how that and that center section that wouldn't work, but could you move a portion of those townhouses over to back out onto the the retention pond and then move some of those single dwelling units sort of interspersed with like I, I don't understand why the townhouse blocks all have to be one next to each other can they not have integrated in between some semis and some single like to break it up a little bit more through you, Mayor Matheson. Yes, we did look at that as part of um, as part of reorienting them into the center, and we do run into the same type of terracing and grading problems. The minute, and I'm going to say for the sake of the way you're looking at it, it, it appears that it runs north south. So for the sake of us to essentially flip those townhouse blocks to a 90% perpendicular, we run into some problems. As you would, you know, single detached houses, you have foundations, and then you have space, and then you have foundations. When you've got a run of townhouse blocks, it makes it a bit more difficult to accommodate. Um, the grading and the drainage out when you're running a, a, a four or a six um, unit foundation versus a single detached foundation. And I, thank you. And the, so that wouldn't work at all to put any of those townhouse blocks up kind of in that for the sake of east west, I guess, it, it, looking at it if it's north south oriented here. Uh, from a design perspective, uh, we thought it was best to keep the townhouse blocks together um, in the response letter that we had provided to the city. I think that there's some um, opportunities for interface uh, with the townhouse blocks on the south side of Street A that we're proposing as well as um, the uh, city's development that's happening on the corner of Britannia and Street A. Unfortunately, again, we create this excess of frontage because obviously you're taking areas that are subdivided for a 14 meter or 12 meter and you're putting townhouse blocks. So it creates these vast side yards that, that looks very peculiar from the street. 
it's not sufficient enough to pick up um, the townhouse units, but it, or it's not sufficient enough to accommodate, a, you know, a single, but it's too large. And it, 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 again, it looks peculiar from a side yard at the end of the townhouse block. Okay, thank you. I did have another question, which might be from Mr. Lunison. I'm not sure. Um, re we received some emails today from residents that were talking about an existing fence and the fact that this fence is actually two feet from the property line. Is, is there's, do we have more information about that? Uh, for you, Your Worship, I, I believe um, there is an existing chain link fence that is in a poor state of repair. Uh, I, I don't think it's on the property line. It, it kind of meanders uh, as you go from um, north to south. The requirement uh, for the subdivision is that the developer will be required to erect a new uh, board on board fence, a six foot high board on board fence, um, where there is a, a townhouse block. Uh, through the site plan approval process, we'll be able to look in more detail at each individual block and see where exactly that fence is um, and um, how it's going to be replaced. A any fence that's um, that's put in place, it will be the requirement of um, the future owner of the townhouse block to maintain. Okay, I just the concern I think was that the, the existing homeowners might lose two feet of their of what they thought was their yard um, in sort of the replacement of that fence on a new or the the existing property line that they didn't know was there. Uh, Councillor Clifford. Yeah, I, uh, I was also going to ask about the emails about the trees. There, there appears to be concerns about trees along that, like where that fence was. Are, the are there a lot of trees coming down? And if there are, are, are all the trees are going to be replaced by other trees? Uh, through the chair, there are a number of trees that will have to come down. Uh, the trees that are proposed to come down are only those trees on this property, not on the abutting property. There is a condition of draft approval that requires the subdivider to protect trees off of uh, or on other lands. Uh, the reason the trees have to come down really is to accommodate grading for the site. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't impact uh, those abutting properties on Briar Hill and elsewhere. And in order to do that, they have to do significant regrading of the site and uh, bring the water up to the proposed new stormwater management pond. So there, is a, there are a number of trees that um, will have to be removed. We did look at that in great detail. We did touch base with our engineering um, friends. There are partners in uh, engineering services to see if there's a way to avoid that. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, there isn't. There will be an opportunity for tree planting through uh, the design of the subdivision and through the future site plan approval process. Councilor Burbeck, follow-up question. Yes, that's a follow-up question to, to about the trees. Um, I'm wondering if, if anyone had considered uh, seeing that it's the, the homeowners along that stretch are concerned with privacy, would the developer be willing to offer maybe some tree, new trees to be planted in the backyard of, of those people as opposed to, so if there, there's a tree coming out on the, the uh, new development side that we would talk to the people on the other side and say, you know, maybe offer them some privacy screening vegetation or trees uh, to accommodate or to help with privacy. Mr. Lunison, any feedback on that? Uh, Ms. Barsdale? Uh, through the chair, uh, if, if the committee uh, wanted to go that approach, uh, and certainly we have no objection to that, uh, what I would recommend is that there be an additional condition of draft approval added that would um, inform staff and inform any future developer that uh, tree planting would be required in the rear of those townhouse blocks. Uh, that's the sort of way to implement it. Uh, whether it can be done, I think, is a question for Ms. Bearsdale. Uh, through you, Mayor Matheson, we did have this discussion as part of some of our uh, follow-up discussions with city staff after the council meeting back in December. And while we have no objection to providing those trees, there are some concerns uh, 
I understand that there are some issues that are around the perimeter of the property with regards to standing water and drainage. So part in parcel of doing the grading to accommodate servicing, there's also going to be edge grading that is an attempt to accommodate some of that standing water and drainage issues that are coming off of the property onto adjacent property owner site. There is a concern that potentially planting those trees may continue to alter that flow. Um, grading has been designed to essentially tip it towards internal to the site um, so that there's no issues. Um, while planting the trees would provide privacy, it may ultimately create revert back to some of the drainage issues and standing water issues uh, that we had that are experienced on the site right now. Anyone else? Ms. Barrisdale, it, I had a question with regard to when this process first started. Um, we had, it had been stated that we would put single family homes on the back of single family homes. Was there ever a design done that had actually included those while taking the drainage questions into consideration? And if so, how did, or maybe Mr. Lunison can answer this, what, what stopped it from coming forward as the design? Uh, so uh, through you, Mr. Uh, or Mayor Matheson, the original concepts that we prepared were loosely based on some of the conceptual design that was done, I think by the town or the city um, a number of years ago when the preliminary possibility of the disposal of this land was discussed and what it may look like. Um, originally, there was some townhouse blocks up and around that corner. It was intended again to interface with what the city's intentions were uh, with regards to the affordable housing project along Britannia. Um, so that was basically used as our jumping off point um, to, to provide for the layout that, that you've seen now. Uh, there's obviously been some alterations to that layout because of street patterns and because of the ultimate sale of that portion of the property. Um, so it's my understanding that from the, the from day one that there was, again, to try to mimic or, or be consistent with some of the intent, the preliminary designs that that's why those townhouses were placed up there. Thank you. Any other member of council have any questions? Councillor Ingram. Thank you. I'd like to move the staff recommendation. And then I also would like to add an additional condition um, in consultation with planning staff earlier today. I'd like it to say that um, I can, an additional condition be applied regarding a development agreement to be registered on title requiring all purchase and sale agreements and or disclosure statements to include a warning clause that all townhouse units and semi-detached units with a three meter front yard setback will be provided with a one warning or sorry, one parking space in the garage and one parking space in the driveway with no overnight on-street parking and limited provisions for visitor on-street parking. Is there somebody wishing to move the or second that motion, including Councillor Ingram's wording? Councillor Clifford, discussion. Councillor Henderson. Does the width of that street, um, any of the streets, like Street A or B, whatever, in that subdivision, currently uh, allow parking? Uh, through you, Mayor Matheson, it's my understanding that the streets have been designed in accordance with the city's municipal minimum standards, so it, which I would assume would allow for and facilitate future on-street parking. So that would also mean there would be no room for bike lanes, right? Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Matheson, unfortunately, I'm not 100% certain as to what the city's standards are with that requirement. Perhaps Mr. Lunison can speak to that more appropriately than I can. Or Mr. Dolovic, if need be. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's my understanding that we, we don't stripe uh, bike lanes on local streets, and so it's not required. The, the road is, uh, is a little wider than a normal street, at least up to street, the first intersection, to allow for uh, emergency vehicles. We don't want people to be sort of uh, um, tied in there, so it's a little wider than normal, in fact. So would parking have been allowed like on one side or both sides at this point? Uh, through the chair, I don't, I don't think we've done the detailed engineering drawings at this point to know where on-street parking will be allowed. Uh, that'll come when we start to review in the subdivision drawings in greater detail. 
Mr. Delovic uh, is on screen, so I'll let him answer. Yeah, through, uh, through your worship. Uh, yeah, it'll be a standard width um, uh, in the rest of the subdivision, which will allow for on-street parking. But then again, uh, you know, you can't uh, uh, you can't block driveways and, and those type of things. It's, it's so it will be limited, especially you know when you have smaller lots and you have a lot of driveways. You won't have a lot of on-street parking available, especially in that area where the townhouses are. And it's definitely not wide enough to do uh, bike lanes on on. And even that portion that's a little bit wider closer to Britannia. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, the recommendation has been moved and seconded with the addition put forward by Councillor Ingram. She moved it and Councillor Clifford agreed to it as a seconder. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. That motion still carries 6-5. Next item. Through your worship, item 7.3 is a resolution regarding a memorandum of understanding for the Southwest Community Transit Association. And there is a staff recommendation that Strapper becomes a member of the Southwest Community Transit Association by entering into a memorandum of understanding with the South Central Ontario Region Economic Development Corporation and that the CAO be authorized to sign the MOU and to appoint staff representatives to the Association Executive Committee and Technical Committee. Councillor Vasilakos and Councillor Burback will move in second discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, to any? That's carried. Item 7.4 is a resolution regarding a lease agreement with Van Muir's Farms Limited. And there is a staff recommendation that an agreement with Van Muir's Farms Limited for the lease of 160 acres of farmland described as part lots 39, 40, 41, concession five, and part of lots 38, 39, 40, and 41, concession six, for a period of three years, December 31st, 2023, with the option of two one-year extensions be approved, and that the mayor and clerk of their respective delegates be authorized to sign the agreement. Councillor Ritzma and Councillor Gaffney move in second in discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed to any, and that's carried. Item 7.5 is a resolution regarding an amendment of bylaw 167-2020, which is the fees and charges bylaw, specifically to Schedule E, the sewage service rate and minimum consumption charge. And there is a staff recommendation that Schedule E of bylaw 167-2020 be amended to increase the sewage service rate for the first three meters of sewage used from $1.41 meters square to $4.22 and minimum consumption charge from $4.23 to $12.66. Moved by Councillor Beatty, seconder. Councillor Bunting, discussion. Councillor Seven, then Councillor Gaffney. Thank you. Could, could we just have an explanation from staff uh, just to explain that, um, as far as I understand, it's more of a clerical uh, thing and not a uh, significant increase? Yeah, through your worship, no, it, it's not a significant increase. It, 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 it was a clerical error in, in the misinterpretation of the uh, the finances uh, of the charts that were provided. And then when staff went again and had a look, uh, we realized that we did uh, misinterpret it. And this will bring it more in line with what it hasn't been in previous years. Thank you. Councillor Gaffney, do you have anything? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, but that was my question also. Okay. Not the, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, any? That's carried. Thank you. Item 7.6 is a resolution regarding the 2021 Household Hazardous Waste Agreement between the Corporation of the City of Stratford and the Corporation of the Township of Perth East. And there's a staff recommendation that the Corporation of the City of Stratford enter into an amending agreement with the Corporation of the Township of Perth East for the disposal of household hazardous waste generated in the township to the City of Stratford Landfill Site Household Hazardous Waste Depot, and that the Mayor and Clerk be authorized to execute the necessary amending agreement. Councillor Vazalakos moving, seconded by Councillor Burback. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed to any, it's carried. Item eight is business which previous notice has been given. There's none scheduled. So move on to item nine, reports to the standing committees. And item 9.1 is the report of the Planning and Heritage Committee. And there's one item listed for consideration as follows. And that is item 9.1.1, zone change application Z05-20 for 1041 Erie Street. Moved by Councillor Ritzma, seconded by Councillor Gaffney, discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? 
proposed spending that's carried. Item 9.2 is the report of the Finance and Labor Relations Committee, and there is one item listed for consideration as follows, and that's item 9.2.1, consideration of the Stratford City Centre Business Improvement Area 2021 budget. Councillor Sabin, you'll move that. Second, or Councillor Ingram. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed to any? That's carried. Item 10 is notice of intent, and item 10.1 is notice of consideration. At the March 8th, 2021 Council meeting, Councillor Seven intends to put forward the following motion for consideration, that Council formally request the Minister to revoke slash repeal the MZO that was issued. Moving on to item 11, reading of the bylaws. There are six bylaws listed for consideration as follows. Item 11.1 .1 is the agreement for display advertising for notices and non-statutory ads. Item 11.2 is the lease agreement for farmland adjacent to the Stratford Municipal Airport. Item 11.3 is the amending agreement with Perth East for disposal of household hazardous waste. Item 11.4 is to amend the zoning bylaw 201-2000 with respect to zone change application Z05-20 for 1041 Erie Street. And item 11.5 is to amend zoning bylaw 201-2000 with respect to zone change application Z0919 for 236 Britannia Street. And item 11.6 is to amend the fees and charges bylaw. And these bylaws can be taken upon a unanimous vote of council present. Councillor Vazalakos, you're moving for unanimous. Seconder, Councillor Henderson. Oh, Councillor Ritzma. Just requesting 11.5 being taken separately. Thank you. So we have it to move that bylaws 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 be taken collectively upon unanimous approval. All those in favor? Opposed to any? That's carried. So that will move to first and second reading of bylaws 11, 1, 11, 2, 11, 3, 11, 4, and 11, 6 for first and second reading. Moved by Councillor Ingram, seconded by Councillor Seven. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed to any? That's carried. Third and final reading, Councillor Gaffney and Councillor Bunting for bylaws 11, 1 through 4 and bylaw 11, 6. All those in favor? Opposed to any? And that's carried. For bylaw 11, 5 for first and second reading, is there a mover, please? Councillor Ingram and seconded by Councillor Henderson. Discussion? If not, all those in favor? Opposed to any? There's four opposed that uh, bylaw uh, carries, but it doesn't have two thirds support to go to third and final reading and would it have to be uh, listed in two weeks? Or if someone wished to uh, suspend, make a motion to suspend the rules, it could go forward today, but it would need a uh, two thirds majority to do that. Seeing no one making that motion, we can list it. Oh, Councillor Gaffney. I'll make that motion. A seconder. Councillor Henderson, all those in favor of suspending the rules? Opposed, Fenny? And that is defeated, does not receive the two thirds majority. That bylaw for third and final reading will be listed in two weeks. Next item, Madam Clerk. For your worship, item 12 is the consent agenda. Are there any items yeah. listed on the consent agenda to be considered by council? Councillor uh, Ingram, Councillor Vazalakos, and I believe I think I saw Councillor Burbach's hand too. Councillor Ingram. Thank you. I, I'm going to let Councillor Vasilakos and Burbach go first because I actually had three items. So whatever they don't cover, I will. <laughs> okay. Councillor Vasilakos and Councillor Burbach. Um, so item uh, 22, the stats can support of the census. I'd like to support the resolution. Okay. Seconder for that. Councillor Burbeck. Discussion? Not all those in favor? Opposed to any? That's carried. Is that it for you, Councillor Vasilakos? Councillor Burbeck. Yeah, that was the same item for me. So, Councillor Ingram can go ahead. She's got two now, apparently. Okay. Thank you. So, I would like to start with the CA 2021. Dash 024, the resolution from the Township of Guelph, Aramosa, regarding advocacy for reform of MFIPA. Seconder for that, Councillor Bunting. Discussion? If not, all those in favor? Opposed to any? That's carried. Councillor Ingram? Thank you. And my last one is um, 
the resolution from the Township of Conmey lobbying the provincial government to amend the Municipal Act and the Municipal Elections Act. Seconder for that. Councillor Henderson, discussion. Councillor Seven. I would just like to speak against uh, the endorsement uh, of that <laughs> of, the, of the item. Uh, I don't, I don't, I just, I mean, the wording really, it, it just, you know, it just says where there are people of dubious character who have a criminal record um, who currently hold office. I think, I think, uh, I don't know. I think it's an undue interference with, uh, with, with uh, the process. So. Okay, Councillor Vazalakos, then Councillor Gaffney. I'm going to speak against it only because I'm not exactly sure of the constitutionality of it either. So I think it's just, I, I, um, I think it's, it's one of those, a rule for, for the exception. And, and I think that we, I think we have to avoid those. Great. Councillor Ingram and Councillor Gaffney. Thank you. So uh, I, I have personal experience with someone um, who did have a criminal record that was very hidden in the community and many members of the community did not know this person had a, a criminal record. Um, and I, I think that uh, without having something like this in the background, you um, run the risk of having someone with a criminal record that has not been expunged by the federal government being a member of council. I think it's quite easy sometimes for them to hide, especially if they are not born and raised in this, this municipality, even in, even being a, munis a small municipality, um, they can hide. Okay. Councillor Gaffney. Uh, I'm gonna speak against this because when you see things like the human rights code notwithstanding, uh, it makes me think that they're going to ignore the human rights code to get to the ends they're looking for. Thank you. Councillor Vazalakos. And, and I will just add that um, it's, it's somebody could have an uncleared criminal record because they don't have the resources to request that it gets expunged. It could be something that is very historical. It could be something, you know, I, I just, um, there's also sort of a long record of um, and, and inequality within the criminal justice system and, and, and who, who, get, who ends up with a record and who doesn't and how long it stays. And so, you know, as I said, I can see that the, there are one-offs and there are a low number of cases of this happening. But again, um, it could preclude somebody who, you know, our criminal justice system is based on, you know, reform and, and giving people a second chance. And I'm not exactly sure that this speaks to that in terms of their ability to participate in society after they have paid what is what, what the courts have decided is their, is their due. Thank you. All right, the motion's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? And that is defeated. Is there anything else on the consent agenda? If not, new business. Councillor Vazalakos. I don't do a lot of new business, so I will apologize for how long this one might be. Um, uh, this isn't actually new business as sort of continued business, perennial business, business that keeps coming up over and over again. And it has to do with the safety, um, certainly traffic, pedestrian um, safety uh, around schools and the amount of congestion that we're seeing around schools. I recently had a phone call from, from an officer to come and have it that I'd worked with previously on the school travel planning and on school with school councils to try to actually increase safety around the schools um, because things do, are not getting any better. In fact, they seem to be getting worse. Um, we have increasing incidents of parents and caregivers who are illegally parking, parking on two sides of the street, making it impossible for other cars to get through. We've had incidences of, of city, city buses that can't get through and are stuck um, and, 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 and any number of really dangerous situations around some of the schools in particular. Some are better than others, but the reality is we have tried lots of different things over the years. Councillor Burback will remember back before we were on council how hard we worked on that at our children's school. We've worked on it through the Active Transportation Advisory Committee. We had a grant um, through the city to try to increase the number of kids that walk to school and discourage parents from using cars 
Um, and I will say, I walked to the school with no cars whatsoever when I went to meet and, and look at the situation. And then I waited afterwards and I literally walked down the middle of the street all the way home. And the only car I encountered, the only vehicle I encountered was the city bus, which means that our streets around our schools for the most part are safe for children to walk, except for the fact that parents have that, um, decided that they're going to drive them all and create congestion and dangerous situations around our schools. And it hasn't been getting better, it's getting worse. And I think it's time that we did something about it. One of the things that I am hearing is that, that it's difficult for staff to do the enforcement or even the police to do the enforcement because then parents and caregivers um, call up and complain to the city. So I think what we need is for council to take a bit of leadership on this and, and, and support both staff and police in their actions and trying to make um, our schools safer. So I do have um, something that I would like, I would like to move that staff work with um, the Stratford Police Service and um, with help from the school boards and Huron Perth Public Health um, to educate and then enforce parking and traffic bylaws around our schools and that this council endorses, supports, and continues to support this, these activities. And there's a couple parts to this. Um, that one of the things to do is to review, with input from the Stratford Police Service, review the signage, the no parking zones, and the times of the no parking around schools, and including some of the parking on both sides, which keeps, keep, seems to be a problem, to have a review of some of the, 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 the um, parking around schools to optimize safety and to decrease um, um, congestion. And some of that work is already done. This is an aside from the motion. Some of that work is already done because Darren Fisher and Michelle Pinto last year worked on this. So there is an outstanding report that actually flagged some of the, some of the smaller signage issues um, around the school. So that's part one. Part two would be to create, um, and this is where consultation with the school boards and the health, health unit would really help. And also if we could get Mike Bites in on this to create a short, concise, and targeted information campaign to inform parents and caregivers that the city will be actively enforcing um, parking and no stopping infractions around the schools. So they have a heads up, it's a short campaign. And then afterwards, part three would be that if we could get the Stratford Police Service to coordinate with our parking enforcement officers to coordinate um, blitzes around the schools and um, I think uh, uh, Darren Fisher told me that they'd done that early in the year and it worked really well. I think harassment of our staff would go down if there was a coordinated activity with, um, with police, if they could you know, find time to do it. And I think what would make sense if they started with the schools that had the biggest issues and then worked their way through all the different school zones. Um, but I, so that's, you know, what I, what I would like to see. And what I think endorsement from city council is needed so that when parents call up and they're yelling at staff or complaining to um, the police, that then they can actually turn and say, this direction came from Stratford City Council. They're committed to making the zones around the school safer for children. And that, that, that they have endorsed this activity because I think part of it is they're afraid of the political backlash from parents. Seconder for that. Councillor Gaffney, and then I had Councillor Gaffney, Councillor Bunting. Uh, that's why my hand was up was to second that motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. Yeah, just, for the, just to be clear, I, I take it you, you want a no stopping uh, at all, or because parking, the definition of parking is, is leaving your vehicle unattended. Uh, so dropping somebody off momentarily is, is not, so, so I, I just need to get it in my, I haven't been around a school for quite some time, as you can probably guess. Yeah. And, uh, they're parking in no parking zones. There are no parking, there's no stopping. They're just not following the rules. They don't know which way the arrows go. Um, they, you know, the one where I was and, and, you know, our director of infrastructure was there as well. There's a car that stopped where it wasn't supposed to stop and another car came along and the one car tried to pull out and they almost had an accident. And it happened to be about 20 feet away from the children where the children cross to get to the other side to go over to the crossing on Mornington. Like it, it really, 
is it, 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 there is a bit of reviewing, you know, our signage and our no stopping and our no, no, no standing, no stopping, all those things. Mm -hmm. But the largest thing that we're seeing is, is parents simply are not um, following the, the rules that are their parents and caregivers or whoever's dropping children off. And, you know, they'll still, they'll park in the no parking, they'll get out, they'll grab the backpacks and they'll walk the kids. Like it's all of it. They're the other part of it is idle like quite often the parents will show up 10-15 minutes before school is out and they'll sit in the car and it'll be idling so when we're talking about looking at our idling by law we could go out there and we could actually you know we could give tickets for idling and on any given Tuesday around most of our schools and 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 we've tried education we've tried handing out you know I think they've tried you know handing out little reminders it's just not working okay. Mr. Burbeck say your hand next yeah, I definitely support this initiative. And I'm, I'm just wondering, because we had discussed probably pre-COVID about making um, school safety zones. And I'm just wondering, were we getting a report back from staff on that? I was, I didn't, I couldn't remember where we were in that process. Mr. Delovic. Yeah, through your worship, but unfortunately with the staff changes and all that and we're short on staff, uh, that's still on our list to do. Um, but again, you can have all these school zones and you can double the fines and such. It still becomes an enforcement issue where we need to work with police in conjunction with our parking enforcement um, as, as parents can get quite vocal when, when you're there try, trying to move them along. I absolutely agree. But I, I think we, we do need to have a clear signage and, and, yeah. and, and it needs to be very clear what the penalties will be. Um, so that people aren't going to be able to use the excuse of, well, you know, I didn't notice or, uh, you know, it, it, the education piece in, is really important as well before enforcement, I think. Uh, but having every school zone the same would also be important that it's a standardized, you know, 40 speed limit and no stopping in certain areas uh, that that would be consistent. Okay. Hey, Councillor Ingram and Councillor Henderson. Councillor Ingram. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to comment on the education piece and, and that I think, you know, we have to get the school boards involved and get all of the schools to send out in their uh, a very quick newsletter within the next week or so, because if we want this education piece to be a very short time frame, then we're talking like three to four weeks so that within the next month we have this implemented and it's, it's moving forward so that it's not just being left until the next school year. But that means that not only are we putting it out on our social media and the health unit is involved in putting it out on their social media, the police service is putting it out on their so social media, but the schools are also doing it very quickly to get every parent um, involved. And it's, you know, it has to be brief. It has to be concise just to say, council has backed this. We're going to be enforcing. You're going to be ticketed. There's no stopping. There's no waiting. There's, you know, don't drive your kids to school walk like it has to be very very brief and concise and quick and then we just have to start enforcing and I want to make sure that we're very consistent in the enforcement piece because if we're not consistent in the, the enforcement piece everything kind of falls apart. Councillor Henderson and Councillor Clifford. Yes I, I totally agree with that like Perth County Greenworks years ago was involved with the walk in school bus so was civic beautification and I know Kathy's brought it forward again from the green community um, and if you don't have somebody there enforcing it, the schools have done their education. Some of the schools, uh, I can't remember the names now, but some of them used to map it right on the, the school in the halls there that how many miles they were walking. So it showed the students walking across the schools and they had partners, um, either a teenager or a family member. They used to call them walking school buses where the parent was at the front and one at the back maybe and they'd pick up the kids along the way and they'd walk to school. It's really important that we walk. I remember when I uh, talked to my grandchildren and all of them were getting rides, I was shocked. And even my nieces and nephews, I was like shocked thinking, they're not walking to school. I mean, all the way to high school, I was still walking to school. I think it's really important. It's, it's for their health, it's for their bone structure, it's for everything growing up and getting to walk. And, and if they're continue to allow it, I mean, I know when I go, when I leave my house and go up by the school there on, on St. Vincent Street, it's loaded on both sides with cars and people just getting out and walking all over the road. And I mean, there's a factory there with big transport trucks coming and things. And 
you know, like I remember, I believe the recommendation was always that you had to park at least, I think it was two blocks away from a school. If you still want to walk your kids and then, or take them to school. And then you had to walk them from that, but you didn't park in the school zones. So I think it's a great idea. Thanks, Kathy. Pastor Clifford. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add to that. If there is a drop-off area, if, if there is a proper one away from the school, I think it should be advertised too. But honestly, I think education is good and I support this 100%. But if people are doing it, the only way you're going to stop it is handing out the tickets. If, if they are parking, if, if it's a legal ticket. So I do have concerns about stopping and parking as Councillor Hunting brought up. So I'd like a clarification on that. And, and, and the, the, if, if it is no stopping, it's no stopping. So I'm just curious about that too. Mr. Delovic, I think would be best to answer that. Yeah, through your worship now, and, and for the one school we were at in particular, there was a combination of off to the periphery, there was no, uh, no parking signs, but right in front of the school, there was no stopping. And it's your standard sign uh, that are installed along there. And, and yes, people can say they don't understand what it means, but this is uh, something you learn when you're, when you're doing your driving lessons and doing the driver's handbook. And this isn't a made in Stratford sign. It's your typical sign that you see throughout, not just Ontario, but it's a pretty standard sign that you see in Canada and the United States. And no stopping means no parking, no stopping to let your kids off. It's, uh, and, and, and it specifies the times on there. And it's only during uh, the school times when the, uh, when the kids are being dropped off or being picked up that we have the, that no stopping in place. Any other time you can you can park there, uh, but in those times there. And so if you go to the different schools, you'll have different combinations of either no parking or no stopping signs. So it's 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 different from it may be different from each school as to what you have. If we wanted consistency, then we'd have to go around every school and see in front of the schools. Let's say change it all to no stopping, uh, which means you you know you can't drop off your kid or pick up your kid just you know. Like just drop them off and quickly go because that's what no stopping means is you, no you can't do anything you just got to keep going, and then further afield you might have some no parking signs up but then you'd have to look at trying to be uh, uh, consistent uh, around all the schools within the city if you if uh, that's what we're looking for, and again that and that probably goes to education of 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 the of the uh, who's dropping off the child saying well I'm just chop I'm just dropping them off I said yeah that's no stopping you can't stop. You can't park. You got to keep moving on. So, um, and then work with the schools. I know in, in previous municipality we had these things called kiss and rides, where it was off, off the street. But school boards then didn't have money, and I'm sure they have the same thing where they couldn't do any modifications to their properties, where they could bring these cars in, drop the kids off, and then move on, so that you're not having that conflict out on the street. So there, there's a lot of work in working with the school board as well. Thank you. All right, Councillor Seven. Thank you. Could I please have the motion read or repeated, please? I'll turn that over to the clerk. Uh, through your worship, if I could actually have Councillor Vasilakos uh, repeat it, uh, that would be great. Okay, so uh, that staff work with the Stratford Police Service, Huron Park Public Health, and the school boards to educate and then enforce parking and traffic bylaws around schools to increase safety and that council endorse and support these activities. And that, that would include three additional um, activities. One, to review the signage and uh, no parking and no standing zones around the schools to optimize times and to increase safety with a particular look at the parking on both sides, which seems to be an ongoing, uh, just we'll stop it at particular attention on parking on both sides. Um, number two is to create a short, concise, and targeted information campaign to inform parents and caregivers that the city will be actively enforcing um, the bylaws. And number three is to work um, for a Stratford Police Service to coordinate with our parking enforcement officers to follow up on the information campaign and start enforcing, starting with the schools that seem to have the biggest problems, but then working through all the school zones. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. I have one question and I can't remember the answer to this. So what about the school buses that come and drop the kids off? And what about the accessibility bus that comes and drops people off? And what about parents that have children that have accessible needs, whether they're blind or autistic or whatever? 
are there exceptions for them to stop and let them off or how does that work? They, most of the, so when we did the school travel planning, sorry, uh, Bonnie, if you, um, um, when we did the school travel planning, a lot of it went, went around um, how to make sure that those, um, there were parking spots for um, parents and for the, the mobility buses and things like that. And one of the things that we actually did work on was having other parents not use those spots. So there are, there are accommodations for those situations where parents do parents or caregivers or transportation companies need access to the school to where the ramps are and things like that. Is there anything further? Anyone? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed to any? That's carried. Is there any other new business? Councillor Ritzmer? Yes, if I could, I, I, I want to reach out and thank so many residents in Stratford for their support of the coldest night of the year. Actually, it's the coldest week of the year event. As I'm looking at the, um, the coldest night of the year website, the Stratford's at 134% of its goal at $93,800, uh, uh, just amazing. Once again, a, a reflection of the caring community we live in. A big shout out to Councillor Bunting for his uh, leadership with the uh, Stratford Slip Sliders and a number of councillors on that team. Uh, their goal has been surpassed of $8,900. And to you, Mr. Mayor, Dan, uh, thank you very much for your work on this. Uh, your, your, support will be over $3,500. So once again, to all residents, thank you very much. Uh, certainly it's, uh, it's a reflection of our community at large and I, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Martin, and thanks for your work there as well. All right, if there's uh, nothing else under new business, we could take a motion to recess to reconvene in committee. And our first one is planning followed by community service. And then we'll come back to deal with the confirmatory bylaw. Councillor Burback and Councillor Beatty, thank you. All those in favor, that's carried. So thank you, uh, Your Worship. And I'd like to call the uh, Planning and Heritage Committee open session to order. Any disclosures of pecuniary interests or the general nature thereof? Seeing none. Delegations, there are none scheduled. Item number four, report of the manager of planning. And item 4.1 is the update of, on the proposed short-term rental accommodations. And there is a motion there, but prior to uh, entertaining that motion, Mr. Lunison, could you give us a brief verbal update on that um, staff recommendation? Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will be brief. Um, at, at the January 11th meeting, um, committee had uh, adopted several resolutions regarding the comprehensive zoning bylaw review. Uh, but at the same time, there was discussion uh, that we have, uh, the staff have consultations with Destination Stratford regarding the proposed uh, short-term rental accommodation regulations. And we are here to report that we have had discussions with uh, Destination Stratford. We had uh, uh, two telephone conversations with uh, Mr. Zach Gimble, or Grimble of Destination Stratford. Uh, during those discussions, we clarified that uh, in some respects, or we, we currently do allow uh, short-term rental of an entire dwelling unit. Uh, we call it an inn. Uh, Niagara on the Lake calls it a vacation apartment. But we do allow it in where we have uh, inns, and inns are allowed in the uh, mixed use residential zones and in the central commercial C3 zone. So, uh, mixed use residential is applied to some sections of Ontario Street and Huron Street. Um, following our meeting, Destination sent a, uh, a letter to, to us asking us that we incorporate some of the provisions of Niagara in the Lake and uh, Prince Edward County. Specifically, that uh, we allow short-term uh, rental accommodations in all places, with the exception of uh, perhaps uh, newly constructed buildings, or perhaps take um, newly constructed residential dwellings. Sorry, or perhaps take an approach where we have um, a maximum number of short-term rental accommodations allowed for over uh, over the entire municipality. 
Uh, both of those approaches are actually a little bit beyond what is normally allowed in a zoning bylaw. Uh, notwithstanding that, uh, that there are some elements of what Destination Stratford did say to us that could be incorporated into the zoning, specifically their, their request that we uh, not limit short-term rental accommodations to the principal resident. Uh, you recall that in December of last year, you gave uh, staff specific directions on how to address short-term rental. Uh, the approach that has been recommended or requested by Destination Stratford is different than what uh, has, uh, you have previously uh, directed us to do. Uh, and when you gave us, gave us direction to limit it, uh, to, to not allow or to restrict it to the principal resident, you had looked at more than 10 different options, some of which are similar to what's going on in Niagara on the Lake and in uh, uh, Prince Edward County. So uh, we don't see any reason to change the approach that you have previously recommended and directed us to do, but we wanted to bring to you uh, our, 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 and, and information of our conversation with Destination Stratford. Uh, there were some questions uh, previously about um, how destination or uh, vacancy rates are impacted by short-term rental. Uh, unfortunately, um, Niagara and Lake doesn't track vacancy rates and, and nobody at Prince Edward County was able to get back to us with an answer. So uh, again, we're not proposing any change in approach, but we want to bring this information to you because you'd ask that we uh, go out and have conversations and consultation with uh, Destination Stratford. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. And questions, uh, Councillor Bunting? Yes, thank you, Shu, through the chair. Um, just so I've got it clear here, the only thing we're voting on today is to accept the, uh, uh, the report from the executive director of Destination Stratford uh, to be received for information. And I, therefore, I assume this matter will move forward to another date. Am I correct or what's the process? Uh, to the chair, uh, uh, it's really for information purposes. Uh, you have previously give us, given us a direction on how to address short-term rental through the comprehensive zoning bylaw. And uh, unless that changes, uh, we're gonna follow the, rec uh, the approach you previously recommended and directed. Councillor Clifford and then Councillor Vasilakos. I'm yeah, sorry, uh, Bunting, I'm... a follow-up? Hold on a second, Councillor Bunting, a follow-up? Yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship. So what I'm, to, I'm led to believe is that nothing really changes uh, as a result of that consultation with a subject uh, matter uh, expert. Am I correct? Through the chair, um, that's right. You previously considered similar uh, options to what uh, has been requested by Destination Stratford uh, when we, and you gave us direction to limit it to the principal resident uh, for a maximum of 180 days per year. Mr. Lunison, we've lost you there. I'm sorry. Um, we missed the last part of that. Oh, I'm sorry uh, that again, you've given us direction on how to uh, address short-term rental in the new comprehensive zoning bylaw. And uh, we see no reason to change that direction uh, based on the conversations we had uh, with Destination Stratford. Um, it's similar to what you'd previously considered. And again, you gave us direction. So we were just going to proceed with uh, how you had directed us in December of last year. So with regards to timing, is this coming back up again at some point before committee or does it go straight to council or what's the situation and when? Uh, through the chair, uh, the next step would be to uh, schedule a meeting for uh, Plan and Heritage Committee to consider the entire comprehensive zoning bylaw. We'll provide notice uh, of that uh, meeting. Uh, members of the public will be uh, provided an opportunity to uh, speak at that, and you can um, take any direction you'd like at that meeting. Yeah, thank you for the clarification, sir. Councillor Clifford and then Councillor Vasilakos. Yeah, I, I I'd like a I'd like a clarification on the end. Uh, what if you have a short-term accommodation, or you have an end? 
is it possible to have a house plus an inn besides? Uh, through the chair, so the, the city, as I said, the city already allows an inn um, and that allows for uh, what people may have commonly referred to an inn or a hotel, but it also in our definition allows for the rental of an entire dwelling unit. So that's a commercial unit usually allowed in a commercial area. The short-term rental accommodation provisions that uh, I think is being requested by Destination Stratford mm -hmm. is in residential zones. And so that's the, the distinction. Inns are allowed in, in the, our downtown core in, in the central commercial zone, our C3, and in our mixed use areas. Some of those obviously being commercial. Uh, Short-term rental accommodations in the draft bylaw, um, that's a provision that would apply in residential areas, in residential zones. Councillor Vasilakos? Um, I was just going to move the staff recommendation and receive it for information. And a second for that, that's second by Councillor Seven, thank you. So the recommendation is that the report regarding the consultation with Destination Stratford on the proposed short-term rental accommodation regulations in the new comprehensive zone bylaw, zoning bylaw, be received for information. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, we'll call the question all in favor? Opposed if any, and that's carried. I see no other items, so a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Henderson, second by Councillor Burback. All in favor? And we're adjourned. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll call, I'll call the community services to order. Item number two, disclosure of culinary interest, general nature thereof. See none. Item three, you have no delegations. Item four is report of the director of community services. And we have one item for discussion, that being the agreement with the local community food center. We do have our director, uh, Councillor Gaffney. I'll move the staff recommendation, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Second by Councillor Henderson. Discussion. Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? And that is carried. Uh, motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Bunty and second by Councillor Burback. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Council will reconvene and I'll turn it over to the clerk. Through your worship, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest made at standing committee to be restated at the reconvene portion? Seeing none. Uh, through your worship, it's my understanding the final item listed for consideration is the confirmatory bylaw. Moving first and second reading of the confirmatory bylaw 11-7 is Councillor Ingram and Councillor Henderson. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? That's carried. Third and final reading, Councillor Gaffney and Councillor Vasilakos. Moving third and final reading of the confirmatory bylaw 11.7 for today's meeting. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? That's carried. And before we before we adjourn today's meeting, uh, Ed Delovic, who's the Director of Infrastructure and Public Works, this is his last council meeting prior to uh, him retiring. And uh, Ed, on behalf of council and all the staff and the residents of the community, uh, thank you for your years of leadership and work. And we, uh, we know that uh, you have another chapter to write in retirement and look forward to lots of fun with your family and maybe some travel when the pandemic eases. And on behalf of council, I just wanna say thank you for your leadership your friendship and all the work you've done on our behalf over the years you've been with the city. So thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed my time here and uh, um, you're not going to get rid of me so easily. I, I, I've agreed with Joan to help her out on a few things. So you, you still might see my smiling face a few times and I might get a haircut. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. A motion for the hair. I could give you a haircut. Yeah. I could do that. Okay. Well, thanks, Ed. All the best. A thanks. motion to adjourn this afternoon's proceedings. Councillor Clifford and Councillor Beatty, all those in favor, and that's carried. Thank you. <laughs>